and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, everyone? It is game day. Jets and Leafs tonight, and uh, this is Winnipeg Sports Talk. Great to have you all with us. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you for the next couple hours. Lots to talk about when it comes to tonight's tilt. The first of two this week between Winnipeg and Toronto. And... Uh, Lots of other news in the National Hockey League. Not all of it good news. Um, we, uh, we're we going to dive into that big story right off the top. Uh, we will hear from Rick Bonus, Adam Lowry, Josh Morrissey before the end of the program. Nick Alberga is going to join us from uh, Leafs Morning to set this one up tonight. And Ken Weeb has his boots on the ground in Toronto getting ready for the first of two between Winnipeg and Toronto. And we'll get to that. I uh, wish I had good news for you Jet fans right off the bat, but it doesn't look like Mark Scheifele or Gabriel Velarde are going to be playing, and that is going to mean a uh, another lineup of guys playing way up above where they normally play. Um, they're going to need to be... Uh, that defensive system that has helped them uh, all year long, uh, it's going to need to uh, show up big time tonight against the Leafs team that certainly can score goals. Um Listen, just before we get into it, welcome to everybody in chat. What's going on? Shout out to everybody on the uh, on the podcast. Thanks for making us a part of your day. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, you YouTubers. If you're listening on the podcast, check out the YouTube sometime. Um, leave a comment afterwards if you want to see what we do with video. And if you are on YouTube, wherever you get your favorite podcast, type in Winnipeg Sports Talk and give us a follow or subscribe there. So uh, if you can't make us live on the program or afterwards on video you can always have the audio feed when you're in your car or whenever else you want to listen uh, hey before we get into it a huge thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day our friends at cool bet just got back in the lock shop with dusty you can check that out over at the edmonton sports talk channel of course our friends at princess auto now the uh, proud title sponsors of the winnipeg blue Hours home stadium princess auto stadium uh canadian club manitoba battery modern man the Winnipeg Jets, F Apparel, Wallace and Wallace, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, Little Brown Jug, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, and of course we will get to a why not question of the day for not Autocorp over at Waverly and McGilvery. Michael Remus, what's up, buddy? How are you? Feeling good. I'm ready for you know tonight's game, Jets Leafs. We've been counting down for a while, and you know the weather strong, so. Doing okay here on a Wednesday midweek. Yeah, the weather is beautiful outside, and it looks like it's going to be uh, going to be real nice for the next couple of weeks. So uh, <laughs> we're all about that. Um, but the funny thing is, everyone's spirits were so great when it was freezing because the Jets were winning. Um, and listen, they've lost one game. I mean, one game, the streak was over. Not the end of the world. But these two games are big ones, I think, for a lot of fans. Certainly, I know for the players. And I imagine that Mark Scheifele and Gabriel Villari probably gutted not to be able to uh, be in the lineup tonight. As I said, we're going to get the Jets side of things with Ken Weave a little bit later on. Um, and uh, we'll also get the latest on the Leafs with, uh, with Nick, who's going to come up in just a little bit. But um, we kind of have to start off with uh, with this story. And this is this one has been a long time coming. Um it was noteworthy that yesterday afternoon, right as we were finishing up the show, um, we got word that Carter Hart had requested and been granted an indefinite personal leave of absence by the Philadelphia Flyers. And I know some people took that as a, as a mental health break or something like that. I think it's probably the world we live in. There have been players that have done that before. There's certainly been players that have been in the player assistance system 
Um, and people just, uh, some people maybe that hadn't been paying close attention to what had been happening since 2018 had um, thought that that's what that was. Now, again, they have not said what it was, but it was quite clear from the Philadelphia Flyers perspective that um, this was a requested leave. It has been given. Danny Briere spoke today and just said that he was not able to answer any questions. Uh, and the questions that were coming up, courtesy of Robin Doolittle of the Globe and Mail uh, from this morning, just before 9 a.m., uh, five members of the 2018 World Junior Hockey Team have been told to surrender to London, Ontario police to face charges of sexual assault. Um, now, this is a, 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 tricky, uh, a tricky topic to get to when we speak about potential players that were named, uh, that, that have not been named, but that will be presumably named once they surrender to police. Um, but it is impossible not to look at Carter Hart and Dylan Dubé, who were members of the 2018 team, as well as Alex Formanton, who was not playing in the National Hockey League, who was announced earlier this morning. He is leaving his Swiss team, Ambry Priata, and I believe the turn is he's taking a leave of absence and returning to Canada. And then uh, the final shoe to drop this morning was um, Cal Foot and uh, Mike and McLeod from uh, the Devils have uh, have been uh, have been granted leaves from the club. Um, Reem, you know this is uh, we'll have more I guess details on how this is proceeding going on, but I mean it's impossible not to connect the dots. It has been a long time coming for this, um, and I think what's important to note. Like this wasn't just the NHL was about to drop suspensions or anything. I mean, uh, these players are being asked to surrender to London police. And London police was under a huge microscope and, to be honest, criticism for the way this was handled initially. Um, I'm not sure whether new people have taken this over. I mean, I imagine some of the reporting of the people that are actually reporting and trying to get more information on this, the Katie Strangs, uh, the Rick Westheads of the world will give us more on this, but um, it, it's sort of a big cloud over the hockey world that you know not a lot of people have been talking for the last little while. We expected the report for Hockey Canada, if you remember, at the end of the summer, but because there were was I guess challenges by players that were involved, arbitration things that they have not been able to put this forward. Um, but the fact that five players from that team are being asked to surrender to London Police certainly is sort of dwarfing most of the other on-the-ice hockey-related news today. Yeah, we're not really talking a lot about, you know, the big slate of games tonight on a Wednesday, and you listen to some of the national shows. Um, you know, you think Jets in Toronto would be a big story, but certainly this is, you know, rightfully uh, overshadowing whatever is going on in the league. And to be honest, you know, the rep been a while. The reporting the Athletic has came out in 2022. It was Katie Strang, uh, Ian Mendez, I think Dan Robson. You know, pretty much detailing what went on and the allegations. Um, pretty disgusting stuff that is in there. And you know, we've kind of been waiting, waiting. What's going to happen here? When are they going to? You know, we're going to hear an update. And this is the update. And you know, we did have as you know, we ended the show yesterday. Carter Hart took a leave, and um, sorry, I just got almost duped by a fake tweet there. Uh, Carter Hart took a leave, and you kind of connect the dots. Well, hey, Dylan Dubé took a leave, and what's the connection between those two? And, you know, Alex Formanton, who, you know, hadn't signed a con contract, it almost seemed that was like an open secret uh, that he was involved there. Now you have the two New Jersey players as well. So I don't know what's going to happen going forward, but uh, this is the kind of the update uh, that we've been waiting, waiting for. For a for a long time. Yeah, yeah, and I know like Jeff Bo is so confusing. Can someone tell us what happened? No rumors. I mean, there was a sexual assault on a woman after a golf tournament in London. I mean, it's been um, and 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 here's here's the thing. Um, you know, the charges at that point weren't pressed. Um, there was a lot of speculation that the London police sort of overlooked things. The bottom line here, and this is all goes back to the Hockey Canada scandal, is that. 
there was a lawsuit put forward to Hockey Canada, which Hockey Canada used a ton of money, which normally would have been used. Now, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, it was part of their insurance program um, to pay this suit to have it settled so it didn't get public. Um, and when that came out, there was absolute outrage across the year that Hockey Canada funds were being were being put forth to settle a lawsuit involving, you know, alleged sexual assault amongst players of the World Junior Team. And that that incident, and again, you know, we'll wait till, you know, whatever comes out of the London police knows. But, I mean, pretty much every player that had the ability to announce themselves not there, not involved, had. I mean, Kale McCarr, of course, was a member of that club, um, but I believe was not at that golf tournament, um, had done so. And it had been um, just a waiting game for at what point, whether Hockey Canada puts out their investigation, which I said the results have been on hold because of this challenge from the players and presumably legal people, whether it was NHL suspensions and discipline, of which they said that when the information is available, they will do that, or the London police, which they did reopening the case. Um, so, I, I mean, listen, it's a real dark chapter um, in Canadian uh, in Canadian Hockey Canada history. I mean, you know, certainly World Junior history. Um, but I think it is important moving forward that, you know, that, that, that these, that whoever was involved is treated as anybody else would be and is not given preferential treatment because they won a gold medal for Canada uh, at a hockey tournament. Um, that is certainly the way it seemed earlier on, um, but that wasn't good enough for most people. And I think the blowback created, I mean, a massive scandal that overtook Hockey Canada. I mean, the entire board <clears throat> is done. Scott Smith had to step down, who had basically worked his entire life to take over as the president of Hockey Canada. Um, and I will say this, I think now with new management and leadership of people that were not at all involved in the previous era of Hockey Canada, I, I, I mean, the thing Reem, is that needs to happen going forward is that the lessons of the way things were handled in the past never are handled that way again. And I do, and listen, I don't have kids playing in, in hockey, but I mean, you know, we certainly work with folks at Sport Manitoba and the safe sport programs, the guidelines, the ability, um, you know, to report things that happen to players um, or people involved in hockey is there. I think all of that has improved. Um, but until this got settled, if you will, and I think some clarity and potentially some punishment to the people that went uh, with it were involved other than hockey Canada cutting a massive check. There were going to be questions and there was going to be a cloud around all of this. And um, as I said, it is, uh, it's certainly noteworthy um, that this is all happening in such a quick period of time. And the Formanton thing that you mentioned, I mean, Formanton, very, very talented player. And, you know, I know this is what uh, sort of is strange. Um, and you talk about kind of open secrets, like there was never any insiders or one talking about how is a player as talented as Alex Formanton getting absolutely no interest in the NHL? Why does he have to go to, why does he have to go to Europe? Um, and a, a lot of that stuff was just not mentioned. And I realize these are very, very touchy subjects. I mean, you cannot accuse people of doing things, um, you know, without having some sort of evidence or facts, but this has been so dug into on so many levels by not the people that normally report on the game or hockey, much like, and it sounds like, sound familiar? I mean, the Chicago Blackhawks scandal? Um, so anyways, that that's the huge story today. And I think what has really rubbed people the wrong way is that in a matter of minutes before this came out and became public, the Utah group trying to get a National Hockey League team today, Reem, put out a big press release that they are all in on expansion. And, I mean, I don't even know if we even touch on this right now because it seems, and again, I try not to be a cynical person. And when I first saw this, I'm like, 
you know what, this could be, this could just be very, very unfortunate timing. They could have been looking, going forth to announce this, but then we start thinking about, like, especially here in Winnipeg, we know what happened behind the scenes. We know that the NHL said to <clears throat> True North and Mark Chipman, hey, if you're going to be doing this, you need to zip it. Um, you know, we'll let you know when things can go forward, when you can mention anything, and they didn't at all. So I have a hard time believing the NHL didn't have a hand in the timing of the announcement that the Smith Entertainment Group has a request initiation of the formal expansion process to bring the National Hockey League to Utah. And then to see, I mean, with all of this happening, no real mention, um, you know, until I guess they have to, so many of the insiders and stuff going about regular NHL business when the biggest story is clearly the announcement today that five players of that 2018 have been asked to surrender to London police, um, along with a number of NHL players that happen to be on that team uh, requesting personal leaves from their teams. It's... Um, as I said, you know, we you, you, you want to be spending more time talking about all the things that we really care about. But if you don't care about this, I think we're, we're missing the boat because you cannot overlook um, criminal actions by people because they've uh, they're really good at something that they do. And unfortunately, in the world, and I'm sure it's happened in the past with Hollywood actors and those sort of things, but it just doesn't fly anymore. It's a terrible example moving forward. And everything that's happened with the Hockey Canada scandal and the overheaval in the sport at a grassroots level in the country, um, I think there there is some good coming out of this. Um, but there had to be some sort of finality to this, at least from Hockey Canada and the NHL. I wasn't sure that we were going to get the London police back in, even though they said they were reopening the case. But it looks like we're getting some sort of finality to that uh, going forward. Um Hustler, you sound sincerely blown away about the NHL trying to sweep it under the rug. Well, I mean, I mean, listen, this is not an NHL thing. They haven't swept anything under the rug. But what is very distasteful, I find, is just trying to distract people with this story today about NHL expansion. Like, you, that couldn't have waited till next week when all these teams were on the player break? <clears throat> Give me a break. There's no rush to announce that. It wasn't like this was going to get broken. Like these people, I know we've got to send this press release out today. We can't wait. Give me a break. And then, I mean, listen, I guess it's a tough position for a lot of these insiders because, I mean, that ecosystem is very unique. I mean, there's a lot of information trading. I'm doing you guys a favor. You let me know this. I'll kind of throw this stuff out and all that. Um. And these guys are, you know, hired to report on the National Hockey League. Um, but when you think about how glaringly absent there was any investigation or talking about what happened with the Blackhawks, I mean, to be sitting here and getting fed stuff about a potential expansion team in Utah when all this happens, I think is uh, is is frankly distasteful. As you really uh, hit the nail on the head here um, with everything. Well said, seeing a lot of positive comments in the chat. And he almost had to go and, you know, do a rehash of what's what has been going on with Hockey Canada for the last couple of years. The board changes, a number of major sponsors leaving, um, players not allowed to compete for uh, the world championships. And, uh, you know, today's report, the London police uh, summoning uh, players to surrender and then, yeah, I mean, I saw, I saw the, you know, I'm scrolling this. I'm like, oh, wow, this Hockey Canada news is finally out. And then I see the report of, you know, Ryan Smith in Utah looking like, did I even click on it? Like, was it even relevant? Like, like who cares that he wants, like, is that, is that news? And then the NHL did, they were pretty quick to put out a statement on that one. Uh, like, do you even care about... <laughs> about reading it or no no i don't care at all about reading it i mean <laughs> so... you no know, and you know what? I'll, I'll just say this i kind of feel sorry for them because like the more we think and talk about this and look at this situation um like put it this way i hope these people get their team like they have nothing to do with this i mean they're a group of people that have not been in the national hockey league they're looking to grow the game and they want to get a team in utah 
good on them. I'm sure it would be great for the league. Um, great. But if, if they had been told to, listen, we got to get out with this news this morning because there's a bunch of other stuff we'd really like to, you know, have people not talking about. Um, so if you can, they're basically getting used. And that's distasteful. And I can't imagine... I can't imagine the reaction, which I think is almost universal. Are you kidding me? This is what we're throwing out today. Um, I, I can't imagine that they're maybe feeling too good about the position that they got put in right now. I mean, it is, uh, it's a bit of a joke. And listen, we're going to get to tonight's game. But it, it you know, whatever happens with the London police is going to happen We'll get some clarity on players. At some point, the NHL has said that there's going to be suspensions and whatnot. But, you know, through our through that, it takes a community to play series and working with Safe Sport, uh, with Sport Manitoba. You know, it, it maybe now is a perfect time to remind people about, and this is not just in hockey. This is in all amateur sport and sport under the umbrella here in our province. And I would imagine it's pretty much the same everywhere else. But, I mean, there's details and resources available at Sport Manitoba slash Safe Sport for the best practices for sport programs, including the rule of two, training opportunities, um, uh, you know, number of tips for, uh, you know, cover scenarios such as texting, carpooling, team gatherings, and more, um, printable guides for people involved in it. And, and then here's, and this is something that is, I think, important for, and this is for players as well, um, because... You know, there's probably a lot of people, a lot of people on that team in 2018 that have had their name dragged through the mud having done absolutely nothing. Nothing wrong, having no involvement in it. Um, and their character's been somewhat smeared. And this is a lesson for people going forward to do the right thing. But there's a safe sport line for confidential help. It's 1-833-656-SAFE-7233. If you're experiencing or witnessing any misconduct or maltreatment in sport, including bullying, harassment, hazing, or abuse, someone will get back to you in 24 hours. And in Manitoba, it's everyone's legal obligation to report suspected child abuse. If in your honest judgment, if you believe a child may not be safe, legally required to report it. Everyone deserves a safe and positive sport experience. And I would suggest that that goes for people involved in sport as well or on the periphery of it. And it certainly needs to deal with, um, you know, the way women and men are treated for that matter. But in this case, I mean, you know, a sexual assault of a woman that, you know, what is we now? 18, we're now 2024 or year, six years later, still part of the news. Um, and again, we'll take your feedback. If you're watching this on YouTube afterwards, hit us up in the chat. Um, and we will get to uh, why we are normally here, and that's to talk about a big game uh, tonight. Looking forward to having the Golden Muzzy himself, Nick Alberga, coming on in uh, just a minute. Um, let me uh, give a, a, a big shout-out to uh, a couple of our sponsors here, including the gang at Canadian Club. Uh, we've got Winnipeg Whiskey Festival coming up, gang, and I've been telling you, Kate, we've got a meeting coming up in the next few days. We'll have exclusive details on an opportunity for WST listeners to uh, sort of take over uh, a WST event, which or a Winnipeg Whiskey Festival event that's going to be happening at the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame. We're really looking forward to being involved in it, so stay tuned for information on that. You can find out more on tickets on the Winnipeg Whiskey Festival now. Those always go very quickly, uh, but you can pick up Canadian Club, all the favorites, 100% rye, CC Classic, 12-year-old, and the original at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts, and keep your eyes out for remaining bottles of the CC Invitation Series, 15-year-old Sherry Cask. And remember, always enjoy responsibly um uh, the gang of manitoba battery is so busy right now i was cold the last couple of weeks a little easing up right now but uh, we know there's a big run on uh, car and truck batteries right now manitoba batteries got the best prices in town shopping local beating the pants off the big box stores they'll deliver it to you for free as well anywhere in the city of winnipeg with a purchase over 60 bucks but keep an eye out next month Brand new Manitoba battery location in the south side of the city on Dover Court. 
We'll have grand opening specials and sale information to you coming up. But in the meantime, for all your battery needs, manitobabattery.com, 204-783-8787. And uh, hey, before we bring in uh, our uh, our pal Nick, um, shout out to our friends at Modern Man Barber Shop. And my guy Cordell, I know someone said I was on a dippity do run today. I'm not sure what it was, but it was much needed helmet reduction yesterday. Cordell's a great job. Got to spend some time with the uh, the house dog, Toby, there. That was at Modern Man Pemina. Uh, but, guys, if you need a cut, you want to look good, get on down to one of eight Modern Man Barbershop locations, including the new locations in Pemina Highway, where I went, as well as Plessy Road. Uh, Modern Man's got you covered with haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. You can make an appointment and book your look via modernmanbarber.com and give them a follow on Instagram at Modern Man Barbershops. All right. We got to get to the Jets and Leafs tonight. As we mentioned right off the bat, not a great not a great morning as far as news coming out. And Ken's going to join us later on. Ken had speculated earlier this week that Mark Scheifele probably wouldn't be playing before the break. But knowing that it's a game back into Toronto, I thought he might be there. And it sounds like Velarde out as well. But uh, it's certainly not going to take any juice out of this one tonight. Let's welcome in Nick Alberga. The Nation Network, the host of Leafs Morning Take, before a big home and home between the Leafs and the Jets. Nick, what's going on? How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. I know they're uh, they're losing sleep up in Winnipeg. I think everybody was hoping for Ryan Reeves to play tonight too, right? <laughs> Reeves, <laughs> you know what? The, we'll, we'll get into the Reeves business. I mean, yeah. you know, for a guy from Winnipeg, he certainly has a very uh, interesting relationship with hockey fans here i mean from his time in vegas and then yeah. all that business with minnesota um but it's sort of been easy to ignore ryan reeves because he's not really part of the story right now in toronto with this maple leafs team is he he's not uh it's unfortunate we we're talking about on today's show that he just seems destined for a guy who's going to be placed on waivers and then maybe play out the balance of his contract with the toronto marley's and the american hockey league i i just think it's so incredible maybe it speaks volumes to the to the market i work in and we're and live in for that matter that the story just got so much play on july 1st when he ends up being a member of the maple leafs for not one not two but three years and it's lasted about 21 games he's been out since uh you know, early December, whatever it's been. And, uh, you know, we're at a crossroads already. So it's unfortunate. Lovely dude. Love the guy quite a bit. Great personality. Great in the room. Just unfortunate. It just he's at the uh, the end, the tail end of his career. And I, I don't know what he can bring this Maple Leafs team. But I'll tell you, it's a big one tonight. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, looking back to the start of the season, I mean, he came in on that three-year deal, which, you know, obviously raised some eyebrows, but it was pretty yeah. clear what Brad Treleving and, uh, you know, Sheldon Keefe, I'm sure was involved in this, thought that this team needed. Um, I mean, he's not a young pup anymore. And, you know, he's so different than just about everybody on the team. And is that a piece that is, is that the missing piece? Or is that a square peg in a round hole? And it was pretty obvious quite early that, Good things weren't happening when Ryan Reeves was on the ice. And we can talk all you want about what happens in the playoffs and having a big guy to go beat the hell out of somebody. Um, and for me, it's too bad because, like, yeah. listen, as much as, you know, he's pissed off Jet fans in the in the past and, you know, you usually do that with big guys on other teams that want to beat the hell out of your own players, um, an incredibly colorful figure, a great quote, a dream for the media, and... Playing in that market, I thought there was a potential that it could be, I mean, entertainment 24-7, basically, when he was around. And, you know, I do sort of feel for him right now in the situation that he's been in. But let's face it, the Maple Leafs are not, you know, sinking or swimming on account of Ryan Reeves right now. Um, it's Austin Matthews. Um, yeah. I, give us your perspectives. I mean, obviously, we, you know, everyone, you can't help but get told about how the Leafs are doing. Um the Winnipeg Jets have been battling for first place overall in the league, but at the same time, the Leafs, while having arguably the number one goal scorer in the National Hockey League, a ton of world-class talent, have just been sort of up and down right now. I mean, they're not yeah. solidly in a playoff spot. Like, how would you, how, how would you assess their play up until this point, and in particular, coming off this road trip into this home and home with the Jets? Very leaky is the way I would put it, but I think it's perfect that the Winnipeg Jets are the team they're playing this week because you talk about the word team. That's how the Winnipeg Jets play. Like I think it's miraculous how this team has done throughout the year with all the injuries, even 
the extended time Kyle Connor was out of the lineup, would they go like 12 and two? I think you look at the Leafs and my takeaway is that they've played like a bunch of individuals and sadly that doesn't work in the NHL. I don't care who you are and I'm taking nothing away from their core guys and their key guys. They've been impressive. Matthews has been fantastic as you documented. Willie Nylander got the bag. He's been great as well. But to me, it just seems like a bunch of individuals. I think on top of that, I think there's some blame to go around coaching wise. There's some blame to go around in terms of personnel, the players they've added just haven't been great. Like they, they, they just been met if, if you can take that as sort of a comment, but I think what the Leafs are looking for is an identity. And I think conversely, you look at Winnipeg, they have that identity. I think Toronto comes out every game and like, I don't know what's going to happen next. There's just, they're, they're playing on hope where the, a team like Winnipeg is playing with conviction. They know what they got to do on a game by game basis. And ultimately it gets into that conversation about the coach and everything else. Right. Well, speaking of the coach, I mean, (laughs) I, I, Listen, I, I couldn't believe, like, I was looking at the standings and like I'm not watching this team night in, night out. And I realized, yeah, they're getting by with a lot of wins that, yeah. you know, are in overtime or shootouts. But, I mean, they're still in a pretty good spot. We certainly see what Austin's doing night in and night out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you wonder, like, where, like, I heard Craig Button fired keep three times in one segment in Sports Center last week. I mean... I was here for it. I laughed my head off. It was great <laughs> television entertainment. Yeah. God knows somebody needs to be on the other side of that. But I mean, how much how much heat has he been taking, and how justified is it, um, considering the team that's been put forth? And you mentioned a few of these guys. Like I, I thought, the Leafs maybe had the best off season. Like to get yeah. Domi and to get Bertuzzi on one year deals where they're not committed for a long time. I mean, to me, I thought they were the big winner, but. Is it on the coach that he hasn't gotten more out of those guys or is there more to it? So that's the big question. Like he has taken a lot of heat lately. Uh, Jay Rosso, my coach, like, I mean, we, we've we been talking about this for like a month and a half, how we both feel it's time for a change. And ultimately, I mean, there is a, lot, a level of patience, I think, with any brain trust. I was actually talking about it today. Why do the Leafs always seem like the last of the party? Like, you know, I try to draw correlation to Edmonton. Um, you know, the, the analytics community can come at, every, come, come at me, whatever they want to say about Jay Woodcroft and his win percentage in the regular season. Well, they made a coaching change and they're 24 and 6 in 30 games since they made that coaching change. I think any player who's played in the league will tell you sometimes that new voice that ignites the team. And I do think the Leafs need a bit of a lift. Um, and that's taking nothing away from Sheldon Keefe. I've been very careful the way I've discussed this because I think Sheldon Keefe is a fantastic coach. Would I be shocked if he went somewhere and won? No, but ultimately it comes down to this. You can't fire an entire team and they're dedicated to this core four. They're dedicated to Matthews. I get that. Nylander, they just paid. Marner, they're going to pay. We all know it. John Tavares is there. Morgan Riley is there. Nothing is changing with this team. And ultimately, that's what I think it comes down to. I mean, conversely, you look at Winnipeg. Their big boys have been phenomenal and that's why they're in this position. Whereas the Leafs, it's like, how often are you going to try to make this work and it's not working? So ultimately, that's what I think it comes down to. It comes down to you can't fire an entire team. So the head coach is a scapegoat. He takes the fall and you hope for the best with the next guy. Uh, That's all I can sort of break it down to. But I think there has to be a level of like accountability and there's zero accountability in this market. That's the number one issue to me. Well, and, and accountability was a huge, huge topic last week when the Leafs had blown their fourth straight lead and lost four games. And, and Mitch Marner was talking about oh, yeah. they're playing awesome hockey. And I mean, listen, he got it. And I sort of get what he was trying to do. He was trying not to be all doom and gloom because there was enough of that around there and focusing on it. But there was a lot of people, myself included, that said, like, I'm not sure that these guys get it. Um, and a little bit of accountability, a little bit of honesty, authenticity, probably would have gone a long way is that just the identity of the team yes yeah it just urgency is the we we use the word urgency like three times a week desperation like it's just like sometimes they go out there and it's like they play like they know they're good at hockey and anybody who's played hockey whether it's beer league or the nhl knows that you can't sometimes win just like that you need to power through and and push through and Again, that stems down from the coaching and the belief. And, like, uh, it's crazy to me. There's just so many different players on this roster, and nobody holds this team accountable. Like, I say this. I've been covering this team for a couple years now. Like, after every season, 
there's not that media scrum where the guy's like pissed off. He's like, damn it, this is unacceptable. We got to change something. It's always like, oh, you know, we had some bounces go their way and that's why we lost the series. We're going to come back stronger next year. And maybe it's as small as say something like that. Maybe it's something as big. And again, I hate to use Winnipeg, continue using them as an example. They looked at a couple things. So like Blake Wheeler, ain't working here. You're out. Pierre-Luc Dubois, ain't working here. I get that situation, but you're out. They weren't afraid to make some substantial decisions and look where the franchise is right now. I mean, I, I, there's so many examples of that over the last couple of years. And I think the biggest problem with this market, every year goes by, they lose. I know they finally went around, but they no show against the Florida Panthers for the most part after game one and two in that series. And there's not really a threat of anything doing something, right? Like there's no accountability in the fact that, hey, if you don't change things, we're going to switch things up. And their dedication to the core four, I think, is crippling this team. And the fact that they uh, have just gone on with hope is just not going to help matters either. Well, let's hit that core four that we'll see tonight. I mean, there's the yeah. good that's been Austin Matthews. And he is um, he's scoring goals and doing things at a historic rate. You wonder, like... Yeah. You know, like the Jets went through a long period without Kyle Connor and a long period without Gabriel Velarde. Like, what would six weeks without Austin Matthews look like for the Toronto Maple Leafs? Think about that for a minute. Um, but on the other side of things, um, John Tavares uh, in a bit of a slump right now. And hey, listen, you get paid eleven sheets. You're gonna be. Uh, you're gonna have quite a bit of attention on you, even if the other guys are the big stars on the club. Um, maybe compare those two guys' seasons and just how much heat Tavares might be feeling coming into tonight. Yeah, you can thank Kyle Dubas for that contract, too. I think the entire year dedicated Kyle Dubas and the uh, fantastic he, work he did for this organization. Uh, jokes aside, I think John Tavares has been the model of consistency for this franchise for the duration of his career. Like, he's not a guy, like, I think in my list of things to worry about with this franchise right now, the captain isn't one of them. You referenced it, the longest drought of his career, if you can believe it, eight-game pointless drought, nine games in a row he hasn't scored a goal. But I just seem to have that belief with Tavares that he's going to pull it in gear. Like, he's such a consummate professional, and his energy doesn't change from one day. He could be on a five-game goal streak. He can be in a 10-game drought. You wouldn't know the difference. And quite honestly, I like that from a captain. Um, so I think he's going to find his way. In fact, I thought he was awesome against uh, Seattle on Sunday. Didn't register a point, but I thought he's headed in the right direction after a four or five game swing where he looked pretty fatigued. But I brought this up on my show too, Leafs Morning Take, the fact that last year and the year before and the year before that, he goes through like a January swoon and next thing you know, it's February and it's like, oh yeah, JT's a point per game player again. So I'm not concerned about him. Uh, to answer on Matthews, it's weird. Matthews will miss time and the Leafs will elevate their play. Like we've seen that time and time before. But I did mention too that... I think if he wasn't already, he has to be in that conversation for a second career heart trophy. I know there's some other guys ahead of him. I still have McKinnon winning. McDavid's going to be in that conversation. Nikita Kucherov, for, because of the market he plays in, not getting the pub he should get. I mean, he's been unbelievable. He was great last night against Philadelphia as well. But just the rate of which Austin Matthews is scoring goals is insane to me. And on top of that, just go look at how he started the season and where he has number, where he is numbers wise right now, it really is incredible. And I, I think voters are going to have a tough time if we get to the end of this thing in the regular season. And Austin Matthews has like sixty-five to seventy goals. I just don't know how you vote against the guy. But again, it depends who else is around him. But I, both players are massive for this organization, specifically Matthews. We already knew this. You know, you mentioned the MVP candidate, the uh, MVP talk, and yeah. You know, with what the Jets have done so far, it's been interesting to hear a few more people mentioning Connor Hellebuck's name sure. in that conversation. Yeah. And again, goalies rarely win it. Um, you know, I think he, he's focused on winning in the playoffs. And, you know, if he keeps doing what he's doing, I think he's pretty much a lock for the Vesna Trophy. Um, but let's talk about the goaltending matchup tonight. I, I, Lauren Brassois has been so good since about his first four starts. I mean, if you look at that incredible streak that the Jets had of whatever it was, 34 games of three goals or less, 22 straight ended on Monday of two goals or less in regulation. I mean, it's hard to even wrap your head around those numbers. LB's numbers were right there with Hellebuck throughout the entire run. So I think they've got a lot of confidence with Brassois in the net tonight, and Hellebuck will be back wearing the 48s on Hockey Net in Canada on Saturday. The leaf goaltending situation has been, I'm sure it's given you lots to talk about on oh, the yeah. Leafs morning take, to say oh, the, yeah. the least. Yeah. 
Samsonov getting the start tonight. Um, he got a win. They beat the Kraken on the weekend, three to one. Um, before that, he had lost five in a row. He'd uh, spent some time away. He'd been sort of playing like once a week or so. Where's Sam Sonov right now, and has he done anything to reinstill a little bit of confidence? Confidence that was basically at zero earlier when uh, they told him to uh, take a break and uh, find yourself again. Yeah, he took a sabbatical, whatever that was. He was placed on waivers on New Year's Day. It's 23 days ago. It really is incredible. I just don't understand. I'll never understand the position. It's become so volatile how this guy goes from not being able to stop a beach ball and two weeks later he's putting up a couple efforts. Like This is obviously a big story in this market is Samsonov, specifically with Martin Jones having hit a wall as of late. And then, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, Joseph Wool. Uh, the prize prospect that they have is still a couple weeks away from returning from a high ankle sprain. So they need one of these goaltenders to deliver stability in between the pipes. And it's been a work in progress all season long. Um, Samsonov making back-to-back starts for the first time since December 9th and 11th. Uh, but I, I think they feel positive. Having said that, we we all saw the first half of the season. So I think you have to tread carefully. But the last couple games, specifically on Sunday in Seattle, I know he's not overly tested, made 16 saves, but he made some monster saves in the third period, and that's what you need. You guys have that luxury, of course, in Winnipeg with Hellebuck and Laurent Boissois. He found something last year in Vegas and has transferred that over now back to his second tour of duty here uh, with the Winnipeg Jets. And to me, it goes back to team system. Like I don't like blaming everything on the goaltenders. I think it's going to be all-encompassing, and I think from that perspective, the Leafs are so leaky defensively, and I think it just gears down and stems down uh, to the goaltending as well. But that that's certainly one of the things I'll be watching for tonight is Samsonov because, again, he's become unhinged throughout this season. He's put back-to-back starts together that have been very, very confident and strong, and now he's playing a really good team in the Winnipeg Jets tonight. Yeah, the Jets, uh, the offensive punch of the team wasn't quite there against Boston, and, and uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the deadline and what the Jets will be looking to do. I mean, they've certainly solidified themselves as a contender in the West, and... You know, with the with what they've done with their prospects and having their picks, they're in a very, very and not to mention their cap situation, a great situation when it comes to picking guys up. Um, and really, I mean, a two C would be big, and we'll probably see that more tonight of just how much they'll lean on a Nikolai Ehlers and a Kyle Connor playing with Vladimir Metsnikov on the top line in the absence of Mark Shifley. But back to Hellebuck for a minute, and I'm interested in your perspective on this because. You know, we all remember what everyone, the insiders were saying in and around the draft. Uh, Hellebuck, that ship has sailed. He won't be back. Um, We all thought that Mark Shifley was probably going to end up somewhere else. I mean, the last couple seasons had not gone well. They'd ended on really poor notes. And then all of a sudden, there wasn't really that market for Hellebuck in the offseason that everyone thought that the world-class goaltender would get. So he and Shifley re-signed. It has been... I mean, maybe the biggest factor in the Jets having no no other stories around them. Dubois is gone. Wheeler's gone. These guys are in. It's about going out, playing together, and winning hockey games, and they're in first place. When you look back at last summer and look at the goaltending situation around the league, including Toronto, Buffalo, New Jersey, we could go down the list. How much regret do you think other NHL GMs have right now that they didn't maybe put forth a little bit better effort to get a guy like Connor Hellebuck and pay him what he deserves? The easy answer is a lot. I've been saying this since the 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 summer. Like I was perplexed. I was stunned. I mean, Connor Hellebuck's been a top five goalie in this league for several years now. And to have somebody out there a year away from UFA who's willing to leave the team he's with and nobody really stepped up. And then I know it's revisionist history, as you mentioned, but like Detroit, uh, I mean, Alex Lyon's been a great story. Maybe they're not the right example, but New Jersey specifically, and especially the Devils, uh, you know, Buffalo, Ottawa, the Maple Leafs, like everybody you just mentioned, like, wouldn't you love to have a guy who's just a lock every game? And again, a lot of this is about system too. I think we, it's easy to forget the first month and a half. And I know this because I watch a lot of Jets games and I have them in fantasy hockey. Hellebuck couldn't stop a beach ball. It happens every year with this guy. He finds his groove in mid, mid-November mid and the rest is history. Like he's been so locked in and so is that Team D. So I think everybody works in process and together in that front. But he has just been so good. And the fact that he was out there 
and nobody stepped up. It's it's perplexing to me. And then ultimately he he ends up back in Winnipeg, and it's like they were about to go on like a mini retool rebuild, and they're right back at it as a perennial contender in this league. And again, maybe it just shows you that patience wins out. And I, I think Kevin Sheveldayoff deserves a lot of credit for the job he's done there. Well, yeah. And I mean that the trade of, uh, I mean, oh. needless to say people here in Winnipeg are sort of, you know, oh, let's search PLD on Twitter and see what they're <laughs> saying in LA right now. Um, but man, I mean, the additions of Velarde, um, Alex, I as well. And yeah. I mean, Kapari hasn't done a lot so far, but I mean, he's a former first round pick. He's got world class wheels. Um, he's going to be getting a chance to go forward. But it, it, it's more like there was also, there is an element of addition by subtraction. And I mean, Wheeler goes into that as well. He was a dominant yeah. personality. I think we could just put it that way as the captain for so long, lost the C last year. But, um, you know, Adam Lowry ascending to being the captain. I mean, there's been no other stories. I mean, like, it's kind of been funny us talking about this team every day on this program in that for about two months, the lines never changed unless, you know, for there was a couple, like, he got injured, he's out for seven weeks, everything's the same, he's back, Kyle Connor's out, everything's the same. And um, they just seem to be all in to win, and everyone has had a piece of it. And that that is such a stark contrast to what's happened in Toronto where you're a team that's sort of being carried by a, a superstar, a couple of other strong players, and then spotty performance in and out. I mean, I'll get you to talk about the Leaf blue line, but just before we move on from yeah. the uh, from the goaltending conversation, like did Martin Jones in some ways sort of save the season? I know it hasn't been great the last little bit, but where like considering what's happened with Wall, what was happening with Samsonov, like w- how important was Jones coming in to just settle things down and get a few wins for the team as to where they are right now in the standings? I think that was a stealth piece of business, first and foremost, uh, in the offseason, because that is a growing trend in this league. It's like we need three billion goaltenders. I don't know what's going to happen if we want to bring in another NHL team, maybe a 34th down the road, too. Like, I think the position is so volatile to begin with, but they sort of looped in like a signing bonus clause in the contract that made a way for Jones to get through waivers to set this whole thing up, because I think any team would know you're going to need more than two goaltenders. So, yeah, I... I I think they knew they would need him at some point in time, but just in the capacity they did was pretty epic, and he stepped up. Having said that, there is a reason why Martin Jones went sort of unclaimed in free agency. His career numbers are what they are. I mean, he is what he is, and I think the last couple games he's resorted back to that. Like, people are using the excuse of fatigue. Maybe it's just I don't believe in the guy as much as other people did, and I do think uh, this market is very guilty of playing up any player. Like, hell, I had the conversation today that they protected Justin Hull in the expansion draft a couple of years ago. So maybe I just see through that that blue lens, if you will. And I think Martin Jones is a really, really good, strong third goaltender. And that's about it. Uh, can he sustain this? Probably not. So spoiler alert, uh, Joseph Wall better return really, really quickly or this team's going to be in trouble. And they got Samson out to figure out too. So uh, it's a it's an utter disaster, and I I say it on a daily basis. I'm the type of person like I don't play on hope. Joseph Wall, great story. He's been really really good. But if you have the ability to go out there and get a Hellebuck type right now, it's UC Saros is that big conversation. How do you not think about doing that, especially if a team like the Maple Leafs tied into these big four guys, and you have so much talent on your roster, you have the assets available to make a substantial trade to shore up your your crease for the next five to seven years. Why wouldn't you do that is my question, you know? Well, I mean, the Winnipeg Jets are the perfect example of a team like you. I mean, listen, it's the nature of the cap world where, you know, you're putting your resources into a big four, a big five. There's a few guys that are eating up a big chunk of your cap. If one of those guys is a world-class goaltender, you're in you're in pretty damn good shape. And Nashville, you bring up, you, Sar- Saros is a great example in that, like that team has been very, very competitive this year beyond what I expected. Well, a big part of that is that they have Soros. And let's not forget about Askarov, who's in Milwaukee mm-hmm. right now. And I think that's the only reason why you actually hear this conversation going forth. Because yeah. if Nashville believes they've got the next one there to become what Soros is, then they can maybe consider it. But there's a lot of teams right there with a ton of talent that don't have goaltending right now. Uh, and it does, there, there's no easy fixes right now. Nick, before we go... Uh, and this is maybe the hardest question of all. This team's been really up and down. 
They're coming off this West Coast road trip. What do you expect to see from the Maple Leafs tonight against the Jets? I don't know. That That's the answer, and that's been a theme to this season. We have no clue. They're consistently inconsistent. They're unpredictable. They beat teams when they shouldn't. They lose to teams when they shouldn't. So that's pro- I'm not I'm not being a jerk by answering it that way. I simply don't know. Like it, it's been that type of year with this Maple Leafs team where sometimes they rise up, sometimes they don't. I'll be honest, my gut feel suggests they show up for this hockey game. I ideally see a split. I think we're going to see a split. I don't know how it goes down if Winnipeg wins this one, Toronto wins the next one, but I think both teams will walk away with two points and and off they go. But uh yeah, it's, you know, the concern for me is like the Leafs and that, you know, that dreaded road trip we like to talk about in the NHL where you go out west, you come back, and you're sluggish. The first 10 minutes are going to mean everything to this hockey game. But you talk about teams who needed more in this game, like it's the Leafs. Winnipeg, I mean, credit to them. They put themselves in a really, really good position in the standings to sort of sail from here, make the Stanley Cup playoffs, and then play for 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 all the marbles in, in the Stanley Cup playoffs where the Leafs, Every game has to be important from here on in. Like we talked about it today. They're only three points ahead of the New Jersey Devils in the standings. Tampa won last night. They've been on fire. So the desperation has to be there. You would think it's going to be there. You just never know with this Leafs team. Nick, great, uh, great chat as always. Uh, again, you can follow him on Twitter, one of my favorite handles, <laughs> at the Golden Muzzy. But uh, feel people in on uh, where they can get the content. Even if they hate the Leafs and they just want to pop in, get the numbers up and hate watch the program with Jay Rosehill. It is a great watch and listen. Yes, well, uh, pop in whenever you can and you want because I do cover the entire NHL, as you know. So I do have a lot of great things to say about the Winnipeg Jets, as I did on today's show. At the Leafs Nation 401, it's called Leafs Morning Take with me and former Toronto Maple Leaf Jay Rozo, and that's at the Leafs Nation 401 on YouTube where you can tune in. It's a daily show, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Hey, good stuff, pal. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, enjoy the game tonight and uh, obviously the rematch here in the peg on Saturday. And uh, then enjoy a little bit of time away from the Leafs when it might be good for everyone in Toronto to have that team off for a week. Yeah, but the thing is, is like we got this whole circus with the All-Star game. Like, I need to get away somewhere. It's been a long 45 games, but all I'll say is like, let's hope Ryan Reeves gets in on Saturday and maybe we got a video tribute or something. Let's have some fun here. A homecoming. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe the, uh, you know, the fight with Lowry at the end of the Wild game last year. Hey, <laughs> listen, it, it doesn't even matter that he's with the Leafs right now. Just the fact that he's associated with the Wild, who, um, you know, I know people, there's a lot of people that traditionally hate the Leafs. The hate on for the Minnesota Wild yeah, is next level it. here in Winnipeg. Mark that one on your calendar, February 20th, when uh, Minnesota's back here. Uh, but it should be good. Anyways, thanks again for doing this, dude. My pleasure. I'll talk soon, bud. You got it. There's uh, Nick Alberga. Great stuff. Uh, Leafs morning take. And uh, give him a follow on Twitter. You can get links to all of his content out with the Nation Network at the Golden Muzzy. All right. Uh, Weaver's going to join us in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Nick was really good. Um, again, Saturday night, Jets, Leafs, if you're able to get your hands on a ticket, get in there. It should be an absolutely bananas environment. Uh, and uh, again, I'm not holding on a lot of hope that Shifley and Velarde are going to be back. Ken sort of p- prepared us for that earlier this week with his uh, reporting from the road. Um, but either way, it's all hands on deck and uh, Sure would be nice to get that win at, on home ice. Um, they're back after the break. The Pittsburgh Penguins are in town. A Saturday night game, Valentine's Day against the Sharks. And then that game I just mentioned with Nick, February 20th against the Minnesota Wild. Go to winnipegjets.com slash tickets. And while you're there, check out options to maybe get back into season tickets for the remainder of the year in playoffs. Smaller game packs and count yourself in for the Stanley Cup playoffs and hopefully get back in as a, a ticket package member for the upcoming season, uh, considering the way the Winnipeg Jets have bounced back this season, I think uh, really restored so much hope and confidence in the direction of the club. Um, thanks to our friends at Wallace & Wallace, Winnipeg's fencing and overhead door specialists. Uh, they've been doing it since 1946. You know they're the kings of the fence game, but right now, a lot of work going into overhead garage doors in the city of Winnipeg. Now, they are the Clopay dealer, biggest in Manitoba, most selection if you're you know, trying to look for a new one. But right now, maintenance, I think, is a big, big part of it. And we know winter is the toughest time for your garage door. Well, the right time to prevent downtime this winter is right now. Give Wallace and Wallace a call to book your inspection and maintenance service call today. They've got you covered for both residential and commercial overhead door sales and service. There's only one name or two you need to know. 
and that is Wallace and Wallace. Shout out to our pals over at F Apparel as well. Guys, if uh, you're looking ahead to the calendar and realize you got some big events coming up or just want to step your menswear game up in 2024, there's only one place to go, and that, of course, is F Apparel. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. Uh, and if you are... Getting married this year, 2024 is a big year for you. Or maybe you're uh, standing up for a pal in a wedding party. Make sure you talk to Andrew and his great staff about a 15% discount on all of your suits when you get them at F Apparel. Pop by and see them, 190 Smith Street downtown. You can make an appointment at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. And hey, if you are looking for a great spot to watch the game, I don't need to tell you the Boston Pizza is the spot, the big game on the big screen, along with a few ice-cold schooners, world-famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and more. And if you are staying at home, you can always get the great taste just in time for game time by ordering online at bostonpizza.com. All right, let's get Remo back in here. And... uh Reem, you know, we kind of hit the Leaf side of things with uh, Nick. We'll get to the Jets side of things of this one tonight. Um, but just playing off our goaltending conversation, interesting matchup tonight. I mean, listen, LB, absolutely deserving of a start. He's been great. I'm really interested to see what Samsonov has going forward because he finally got back in with a win and had a solid game in his last outing against Seattle. But before then, it had been a nightmare season for the Jets net, for the Leafs netminder. Yeah, goaltending certainly be a problem uh, tonight. The one thing that was interesting to me, just putting together this uh, little tonight's matchup graphic, has look at uh, the difference in goals allowed per game. You have the Jets at the league's best, 2.29, and the Maple Leafs down there, 3.27 uh, goals allowed per game. That is uh, just out there, just outside the bottom third. So what, like 12th uh, lowest. In the league, and you know their power play uh, very strong, twenty four percent. The Jets uh, running at sixteen percent. So the PK is gonna, you know, they were pretty good last game, but the Leafs they got the eighth best power play in the league. And yeah, goaltending a concern, and for the Jets team that has had trouble scoring goals without Mark Shifley and I uh, know Gabe Velarde in the lineup, they're gonna need some guys to step up. And check out this tweet from Ezra Ginsberg of Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Uh, they do the post game here on YouTube. Look at this. Need a rider. No goals in his last 11 games. I have follow. No goals in his last nine games. Morgan Barron. No goals in his last eight games. Adam Lowry. No goals in his last six games. Perfetti. No goals in his last five games. Kupari. No goals in his last 19 games. So you're going to need someone here. Step up. Uh, who's it going to be? You know, two guys you mentioned there. Lowry and Need a rider. Uh, they put Mason, playing with Mason Appleton, who he's got a bit of a had a goal scoring streak going into uh, the last game. But that line was so good at the start of the year; they were magic, and they just haven't been able to recreate that as of late. And I'm not well, they're sure. Back together, I mean, they're back yeah, they're... together, which is I think an important development for this game tonight. And you know what's funny? I, I you know shout out to Ezzy for an insightful tweet just looking at you know a little bit of a uh, a slow period for a few players on this team mm -hmm. i think that's probably a big reason why they're going back to nino uh with lowry and appleton i mean we were talking about the appleton drought which uh, went on for 25 games he of course is you know scored in those back-to-back -back games and had that uh, that uh, the super greasy one and then a really nice one in the following game um, I'll say this about Nino. He scores in bunches. And, um, you know, to get something out of that line tonight, listen, not only would it be would be nice, but it's almost necessary because, I mean, the Leafs are a very, very high-octane offensive team, um, but they're not very good defensively. So, I mean, you know, as well as the Jets play defensively and Laurent Brassois can be brilliant, you have to assume that the Leafs are going to get theirs. Um, the bottom line is they do need to do something offensively. And I was digging into the expected goals numbers, like through the first couple periods in Boston, as ugly as you've seen. I mean, there just was almost no offense from the Winnipeg Jets, and that's going to need to change tonight. Um, you know, Vlad's been, <laughs> Vlad has been everywhere in this lineup. 
He started this season as the fourth line center. Tonight he's going to be the number one center. But I do like Bones getting him up there and putting Kyle Connor and Nikolai Ehlers together. And to be honest, I think this is, has Ehlers' game written all over it. Um, he is a guy that can drive a line. Kyle Connor certainly, I mean, is a finisher along with the best in the league. But to me, I think that Ehlers is going to be... Um, well, it's a big opportunity for Ehlers to remind everybody that there's more than Mark Scheifele and Kyle Connor on this team when you're talking about the stars of the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, big game and national stage. You know, he really stepped up when put on the first line with Kyle Connor out, and he continued that with the uh, with the overtime winner on Saturday. And I, I like this Connor Ehlers putting together your two best offensive guys. Domestic Oz being able to play with just about anyone. We know he can play with Ehlers. And you don't exactly think number one center when you think Vlad Domestikov, but I mean, that's where the Jets are. And I'm not, you know, Ken's coming up. We asked him in the summer, or at least I did, about the second line center and put him in an 18 minute pretzel. I'm not sure which ones I think is the Lowry line, the second line, or is any line Cole Perfetti's on uh, the second line? They got the middle six and then the clear uh, fourth line with Baron, Kupari, and Axel, who were really strong. Before, you know, they had a big stretch there in that homestand. Same with Toninato. And they're going to need everyone to pull in the same rope tonight against Toronto. But you mentioned they do give up a lot of goals. And I love Nick's answer. So what do you think you're going to get tonight from Toronto? He's like, I have no, no I have no idea. idea. And <laughs> and he's like, I look, I don't want to be an ass and give you a, a bad answer. But we don't know. But that hasn't, at least for the majority of the season, that hasn't been the case for the Jets. They've really played the same game a lot. And maybe the last few, it's been slipping uh, a bit with injuries. So... See if they can maintain that tonight. You know they're, you know they love beating the Leafs. We all again talked about it yesterday. We all saw the yeah. video in the room, they're like <laughs> they're all pumped about it. So, uh, we'll see what happens. I'm looking forward to this. Well, there'll, there'll be some juice to this game. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from Ken, who's going to join us right now. Who uh, you know was there in the building this morning, the throngs of media assembled. Um, and, you know, remembering a little bit about, you know, for teams, for two teams that only play twice a year, um, there has been, I don't know whether we want to call it a rivalry, but certainly some uh, back and forth. Let's bring in Ken Weeb from the Winnipeg Free Press. Weber, um, thanks again for doing this, and uh, great to have you in on a game day before a big one tonight. Hey, listen, I just have to ask you, um, before we get into tonight, how much were people actually talking about the game today uh, at the rink, or how much were people <laughs> talking about uh, what's coming out of London, Ontario? Well, I, I think just with the timing of the availabilities today, Huss, uh, I think the stuff only dropped after the Leafs room had basically been open or maybe almost closed, so uh, there wasn't a ton of reaction being sought and i mean honestly no no i mean more your conversations like when the media are there kicking around talking well, no like sure Hus, but this is what i'm saying so like the i think it dropped around 10 40 which is like exactly when the room opened so i don't know how many people were aware of it until the leaf stream was already uh, closed <clears throat> so uh yeah but as soon as that became available everyone is on their phone and trying to find out the latest i mean elliot came in and i had a few minutes with him but i mean understandably he was waiting to hear the, what was coming next from the New Jersey Devils or what other whatever other team has dropped since in terms of players moving around and um, you know having to do other hits and everything else. So yeah, of course it's a it's the biggest story in hockey. We've been waiting for this other shoe to drop and and, and now we'll, we'll wait further. I mean it looks like if you're uh, piecing things together, or some of the names are becoming a little bit clearer. Hus, but I mean you got to be careful in terms of. Uh, I mean these are these are still it's. These are still allegations, so you have to be careful in terms of this is a horrible thing that happened, and I hope that justice is served and things get sorted out. But uh, in terms of you know what we exactly know about what happened inside that room, I, I think that uh, the court of law needs to continue before. Again, like this is not a parallel situation by any stretch, but. Um, a month ago, we thought poor Corey Perry was out of hockey, but we didn't really know what happened, and now he's back in the NHL. So, uh, do you remember I think how it's, much? How much did? How many million dollars did Hockey Canada pay to settle that? Yeah, do I don't remember. No, sorry, Huss. I mean, that's a story that uh, the the number was very high, and it was a pretty bad look, um, quite frankly. Well, so, I mean, it it essentially blew up Hockey Canada as we know it. I mean, the right. entire board is gone. I mean, there's new management, and and this is the weird the, the thing about this, like. This story sort of became 
like it was easy to go on and focus about the games and all that, but there had been another shoe to drop. And For sure. we all remembered we were expecting this report at the beginning of the year. And they have been unable to put it out because of a challenge from um, I believe some of the pe the, the 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 people involved um, right. that were on that team. Um so I wasn't sure whether that was going to happen, and the NHL has said that there will be discipline on this when at what point it's done. Um, but the fact that the London police, after o reopening the case, have asked five individuals to surrender themselves, obviously it's a massive, massive story. I I was just wondering because, again, far be it from, from me, I tried not to be too uh, – think oh, here it is, $7.6 million. There you go. Of a national exit we won, but that that included twenty one settlements. Which yeah. the fact that there's twenty one settlements involving that stuff is um, it's concerning. It, yeah, yeah, there's no it, doubt about. Yeah, ahead, sorry. Yeah, read. seven point six million out of a national equity fund funded partially by player registration fees held payout settlements in twenty one cases since nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, the uh, the thing I think that I I and again I don't know at the start I wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt. But having the Utah people drop this expansion news that they're pulling forth, I mean, within minutes of it, and then having that being what some of the insiders and stuff, I mean, it's their job. They have to put out. I mean, it was a uh, it was a, a tough look. And, I mean, listen, I, mean, I was listening to Merrick's show. I thought he did a great job talking about this. Yep. He uh, had um, Chana Goldberg on in their first segment of it and, you know, talked about the people we should be thinking about, victims of this sort of, sort of thing um moving forward um but the the fact that the jets and leafs are playing tonight did not even get a mention until right before the top of the hour when they were going into lines um but through all this it's going to be dominating a lot of sports center and thank god for the katie strangs and rick westheads out there yeah. that have actually done the work on this um there's a big game tonight and uh the jets go in and I will say this, I, I had always been holding out a lot of hope that Shifley was going to be in this game. But you, were, you weren't listening know, to me, Huss. You weren't listening to me. I was just about to say, Ken, if you, would not, if you would wake yourself up and just be quiet for a while. The minute you threw that out earlier on, I'm pretty sure that wasn't, a, uh, wasn't just a wild guess. So I, I, my, my hope and my intuitions... Um, Diminished greatly when you said earlier on there's likely that Shifley won't play until the uh, end of the player break. And uh, I guess that's uh, that's the way it goes tonight. And that sets up a team that did not have almost anything going offensively against the Boston Bruins. Uh, Going to need to step up and find it more in the other team's end as well as they normally play defensively. Well, Hassan, I should say that uh, Rick Bonus did leave the door open a smidge uh, in terms of not ruling Shifley out for Saturday, even though... He gave me a good try, and then I said, well, Rick, I mean, <laughs> based on the schedule, will you consider playing him knowing that you have a break after? And he basically said, Mark's body will tell me when he's ready to play. But uh, it's interesting because I, yesterday I, I I was quite confident in my reporting, Huss, uh, but then as the t last two days went and Mark started to look better and better on his skates, I was kind of like, oh, maybe, maybe he has had a breakthrough here, but... Uh, then he also, today, he was one of the last guys onto the ice and he wasn't in the line rushes. So it was pretty early on that we had the indicator that he wouldn't be playing today. But, you know, uh, he's in a situation where it hasn't been ruled out. But I just think us, I mean, we we in the media get kind of caught up in the moment. And yes, of course, as an Ontario kid and who loves the national spotlight, would Mark love to be in the game today or on Saturday on hockey night? Yes, but... Like, let's be quite frank here, Huss. Mark would like to be playing in games on the main network in May and June after April, right? So uh, that has to be the end goal in mind for him and for the Jets ultimately, even though, yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, uh, Mason Appleton ended his long drought, but now the laundry list is getting long again. You know, Nieder, I think as he put out a tweet a, a little bit, a, a little while ago, 11 for Niederreiter, 9 for Iafalo, and, you know, the list kind of goes on and on. So, the secondary scoring has been a tremendous asset for the Winnipeg Jets this year. Uh, and there you see the rest of the numbers here for those listening. Uh, Barron, no goals in eight. Lowry, no goals in six. Perfetti, no goals in five. And Kapari hasn't scored yet with the Jets this year. So when you're missing two-thirds of the top line, 
Uh, that means those guys, among others that are, you know, that have been mentioned, need to step up offensively. And Hus, it's funny we're talking about offense, whereas the Jets just gave up four for the first time since basically November. So their focus, especially against a team like the Leafs, has to be, you know, not exclusively, but the primary focus has to be on defending against the likes of Austin Matthews, Willie Nylander, and uh, Mitch Marner and company. Whereas you know, you and I are kind of thinking, hey, wh- when's the offense going to wake up? So uh, it's tough to a- win zero zero. Well, no, no, but it's a delicate balance, right? Because <laughs> yeah. this team's foundation has been a five on five play and b defending to the point of not allowing many goals. And you know, as Morgan Barron told me yesterday, hey, if you're only giving up two or three most nights, you're in every game. You know, provided you're not getting shut out every night, and they've only been shut out twice this year in 45 games. So uh, eventually, the offense is going to come provided your defensive structure is good. But at the same time, we know one of the elements that could improve on that front would be to, you know, when the five and five scoring kind of dries up a bit, you got to score in the power play. And that's uh, why we've seen some uh, flip flopping around and Hus, Hey, you saw the quote that I posted. I mean, Rick was Rick could not have been more direct in terms of my question about what he was looking for unprompted. We don't have a number one unit right now going into the game. Whoever is moving the puck is going to become the number one unit and they'll, you know, get the starts and get probably the majority of the minutes. So that was a pretty declarative uh, shot across the bow from the head coach saying, hey, number one unit, if you don't get it going, those other guys are going to be the number one unit, even if it's temporarily. And uh, to me, that was uh, that was pretty, pretty decisive. And I think it's interesting. I mean, Neil Pionk is a guy that Huss, he used to run the power play right at the top. So the fact that he's become a shooting option, I like that idea. I think it gives it should give Josh Morrissey two options on the flanks, and it will also give Morrissey a chance if those guys get one time or lanes available to them. It will allow him more time and space to get shots off from the top of the umbrella. So, hey, when we're talking about the power play, is it just me, or does it seem that if the Jets get a shot in the first ten seconds or fifteen seconds, if they get one early, <laughs> they seem to get plenty more? Yeah. If they have a poor start, it seems like they just never really get into a groove. Yeah, it's fair. And it, it's a little, it becomes hustle. Like everything at five on five, we got to remember, this was a two-year process under Rick Bonus in terms of the evolution of turning this team into structurally sound defensive hockey team. It took them a year and a half, essentially, or at least a full year where they had some regression and everything else. Whereas on the power play, it was something that used to come so naturally for these guys. They're all, they've always been gifted offensive players and had that responsibility. But now all of a sudden you get a, a bunch of offers stacking up and now you almost second guess yourself. You're, you're shooting when you should be passing, you're passing when you should be shooting. And then some other times you're not even really looking for the lane, even if you have the lane. So um, the big thing for them, they need to create some chaos, and, and that comes from shots. That comes from the ability to have retrievals in front of the net and when the rebounds get shot into the corners. But it's been too much one and done for the for the Jets lately, us. And quite frankly, a lot of the times they haven't been getting to the one before the done, and they've struggled lately with their entries. You got two exceptionally explosive uh, wingers in Connor and Ehlers, Um Ehlers' zone entry machine, Connor very good at it himself, and then Josh Morrissey's also exceptional when it comes to zone entries. Yet, a lot of the time in the last few games, Huss, they've been struggling to even get in the zone. They've been chipping and chasing, and a lot of the times they aren't getting the retrieval, they're not getting set up, and then you almost see like a, a shoulder sag where you can't get into the zone, it's a clear by the opposition, and then it's like, oh man, got to go back and get it again and reset and and try to build speed through the neutral zone. And it's just become a frustrating, it just is the compound interest, I guess, if you will, uh, has been frustrating for the Jets as a group. And then too, now you're wondering, I know we've heard Mark Shifley say it, we've heard other players say it, the Jets are predictable at five on five, but they haven't been predictable on the power play. And they've had a lot of rotating parts and there just isn't a lot of cohesion there. I mean, the other day, yes, they had, it was against Ottawa where they had a little bit of movement, but they only really got one or one or two shots. And, I mean, again, I don't understand people are up in arms. Oh, Jets gave up a shorthanded goal the other day. Huss, 
Nita Ryder was out of the box for a, like 0.5 or one or two seconds. That was, he that's not a shorthanded a goal. Error is what that yes, is. Yes, exactly. That is that fifth player is not involved. It's a four on four. Morgan Geeky drives the net. Josh Morrissey makes a nice poke check. The puck lands on the stick of Jake DeBrusque. It's in the back of the net. That's not. Oh my God! How could the power play let the Jets down again? Now, having said that, they didn't score in yeah. the remainder of the time that was left. But it wasn't like. Oh my God! These guys were lazy on a power play. They got scored on, and that was sort of the no, anyone that says that was goal. not watching the exactly. game. Exactly, that's, that's wake up territory here. Yeah, that's it, wake it, up. That's territory. definite wake up territory. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, it, as far as the game tonight goes, well, actually, I do want to ask you quickly about Boston sure. because you brought that game up. I mean, you were in the building. We were all watching on the tube back here. <laughs> it did seem like the Jets were getting worked. By the Bruins, I mean, they were aggressive. They were relentless on their forecheck. I yeah. mean, I don't know if Josh Morrissey will have two longer shifts in this entire season than he had in that game. And yet, you pull up that box score afterwards and you realize that Bruins only had 20 shots. Like, right. are we sort of focusing more on it just because of how much possession they seem to have? Like, how do you parse... The fact that the Jets certainly were not controlling play by any stretch of the imagination, but still allowed Boston only 20 shots on Connor Hellebuck, although three got past him. Yeah, Huss, I mean, that game, you were right, and you, you those terms you used are absolutely apropos. Like, relentless is a word that I use, uh, that is a perfect description. They were all over the Jets, and Huss, quite frankly, the Bruins made the Jets look slow, and we know the Jets are not a slow hockey team. Mm -hmm. For two periods, the Jets look slow. Their breakouts were very disjointed. Uh, there, there was very little support, but it was more the Bruins imposing their will, which is exactly what the Jets did to them on December 22nd, Huss. So, and again, I talked to James Van Riemsdyk before the game, and he was very complimentary towards the Jets, but the Bruins knew exactly what they needed to do in order to not look bad the way that they did in December. And they basically just turned the tables, quite frankly, on the Jets. And I don't think it was from a lack of effort. It was just like they were swarming all game long. The Jets had very little support and very little speed. And even when they got speed through the neutral zone, there was a guy coming with back pressure that didn't allow them to enter with speed almost at all. So I, I agree. I would say a positive for the Jets, even though I'm with you. I, I thought that the zone time, and again, I didn't look at the numbers, but by the eye test, the Bruins had the puck a lot more, but that's also a testament to the Jets' structure. Even in a game where they look slow, they didn't give up a ton, but in this case, what they gave up was fairly substantial, right? The, the first goal by Lauko, that's a that's a breakdown and basically a backdoor tap right after the rebound comes out. Uh, Jets, again, a little bit disjointed in the D zone. And the one thing, Huss, too, I mean, you touched on it. Uh, you know, the combination of the taxing schedule and the injuries, it's not an excuse, but what we've seen, quite obviously, is a little bit of a regression on the puck management side of things, and that's led to some, like, heavy-duty breakdowns, which have not been very apparent or abundant uh, in the last little stretch of time here. And that's something that when you're playing against a top team or an elite team like Boston, or if you're playing against a high octane team like the Leafs, you better be careful in terms of where you're turning the puck over and what kind of odd man rushes you're giving up. Cause when you play good teams, they put the puck in the back of the net and they make you pay for those mistakes in a way that maybe the Chicago Blackhawks or the Columbus Blue Jackets were unable to do against the Jets. Ken Weaver, the Winnipeg Free Press with us in Toronto. Six o'clock puck drop tonight between the Jets and the Leafs. They'll uh, get back at it here in the PEG Canada Life Center in a sold-out building on Saturday night. Um, back to Bones' quote about sure. really not having a number one line last night. I mean, I, listen, we finally got to talk about the industrial blender coming out. <laughs> it had been a long time. That thing had been back. They don't even think they were bringing it on the bench there for a while. It was full on ninja, Huss, yeah, on, uh, yeah. on, on Monday. Like, full, the foodie, full the blast ninja. Foodie. ninja. <laughs> yeah. Um, but going into this game, we see Nikolai Ehlers and Kyle Connor playing with Nemetsnikov. I would imagine... Uh, it's a big challenge and opportunity for both, particularly Ehlers and Connor, to drive play offensively. And from my perspective, if they could get off to a good start and get a lead, that would be a huge, huge plus for them tonight because 
we know the difficulties that the team and many others have had scoring lately. Just thoughts on those players in particular and how much Nino Niederreiter and Mason Appleton might benefit from having Adam Lowry back in the middle. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, the reason why I listed the Lowry line second, I mean, you touched on it earlier on. I mean, Cole Perfetti is, I'm not, I'm not calling Cole Perfetti a third line player, but I'm telling you today in this configuration, he's going to be probably playing third line minutes. So we know that the Lowry line will be uh, over the board second. They will be playing against either Tavares or against Matthews as much as humanly possible. Uh, so that's why I wrote them that way. And yeah, I mean, let's also not forget the Lowry line has been the Jets most consistent line on a lot of nights this year. Um, and they need to be that on a guy on a game like this. And Nemestikov can play well with anybody. Uh, Kyle Connor, uh, he was very direct in his post game comments. He didn't like the way that the Jets played. He thought, you know, he said they were too tentative at times. And I think he even used the word timid, which kind of struck me. I, 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 he was right, but I mean, he was very, 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 po- or, I mean, very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, Huss? It, it just was, he it was quite frank, some some frank commentary, which isn't uncommon for Kyle Connor, but he had been away for so long, I kind of forgot that, and there's games that he didn't like, he was he was kind of as honest as Rick Bonus can be at times. So, I mean, Ehlers has, has been driving play a lot, and and he has to. Like, this. these are the kind of games where, uh, Nikolai, the Leafs don't defend well. So Nikolai Ehlers needs to find uh, soft spots in the ice, generate with his speed, and then either find a shot lane for himself or find Kyle Connor uh, in space because, quite frankly, the Leafs don't defend well. So that should lead to opportunities. Ilya Samsonov, yes, good effort against Seattle or, uh, yeah, against Seattle to end that road trip. But let's not kid ourselves. This is a guy who had to get sent down to the minors in order to get himself sorted out. And that's not to say that he couldn't get himself sorted out because he played great the other night, but uh, question goaltending has been a massive question mark for the Leafs and their best goalies, their number three goalie, who they weren't even planning on having in the NHL this year in Martin Jones. So, I mean, there'll be opportunities available. Now, having said that, I mean, Sheldon Keefe's been trying to get the Jet, uh, Leafs to commit the way the Jets have for the last four years. And there have been some strides taken, but... This year, it seems to be going back the other direction. So uh, it's the old, uh, you know, irresistible object versus a movable force kind of kind of matchup. But which team's going to be able to impose its style on the opponent? And uh, that, to me, will probably be the team that decides who uh, ends up on the victorious side this evening. Well, and, and, and listen, just to, to build off your point about the uh, sketchiness of the Leafs goaltending, um, it would be massive for the Jets but also a huge negative for the Leafs if they could get a couple early. Um, you know, I think you really put yourself, like, I can't imagine if a couple early ones go in on Samsonov the way, the, like, we've been there beforehand. I mean. Well, they booed him out of the building a few times already this year, right? I mean. There are they'll be right that, back to that point before us, the there first been, break. There have been media people saying the Leafs can't play Ilya Samsonov ever again. And, you know, he's only had one start since that time, but. Uh, it, it's it's things have turned pretty quickly, uh, you know, from from the guy who kind of helped them win a series last year to, uh, you know, being out of the league momentarily. So yeah, I, I'm with you. And Hus, I, I think the intrigue for the other side, I mean, quite frankly, Lauren Brassois is a guy who, I mean, if you're Brad Living, how can you not be looking at Lauren Brassois and thinking next year I'd like to sign Lauren Brassois to be paired in a tandem with Joseph Wall, right? I mean, you can't imagine Samsonov being counted on next year unless he has a complete reversal of fortunes in the second half. And as good as Martin Jones has been in stabilizing their season, I mean, Brassois, the way that he played A with Vegas last year and B with the Jets this year, and you have to think the Leafs are not wanting to spend a ton of money in the goalie position. I cannot see a better scenario for them to pick up a guy at a reasonable price that has played incredibly well than Lauren Brassois right now. So if, if you're Lauren Brassois, Huss, and you haven't played since January 11th, I mean, you're going to have, he's motivated to play well every night, but this is a big, this is a big stage him. game for him. And if you play well against the Leafs, maybe you plant that seed about maybe potentially being a guy that is on their radar come J- July 1st. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, uh, you know, some games, in the season are bigger than others. This one, I mean, listen, it's a Western Conference team against the Eastern Conference team in the big picture with the standing it's not, but for individuals. And make no mistake about it, 
every opportunity that Lauren Brassois gets to play, especially behind this Jets team with the way they're playing, is another opportunity to showcase what he can do with a solid team in front of him. And it's only going to help him come next off season. When I would imagine, especially considering what we've seen so far this year, there'll be plenty of interest and plenty of opportunity for LB to go to a place where he won't be a backup. He might not even be a 1B, to be honest, looking right. at around at some of these other ones. He certainly wouldn't be if he was in Toronto right now with Wall on the show. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, Sheldon Keefe saying that uh, even though Wool is making some progress, he, he would say his return after the All-Star break was not imminent. So, uh, you know, take that for what it's worth. So, but yeah, Bruce has been a great outside, you know, after the first couple starts where it was a bit uh, wobbly, but you got to remember, I mean, Connor Helbuck had a couple wobbly starts, but like Brassois like that reliever, the mid reliever that came in and gave up the grand slam. And you're trying to wonder why my ERA is still at 9.75, even though I've had two really good months. You know, the, he had the old infinity pool in the first start and uh, has had to kind of chip away, but he, he has, he's done more than chip away. His numbers are hella Buckian, just minus the volume of starts. So, uh, and that's a testament to A, the way the Jets have played in front of him, but B, also to how great Lauren Brassois has played when called upon. And uh, I know that the Jets would have liked to have gotten him a start a little bit earlier. Like this is uh, tracking to be a, a, among the longest stretch of time. I haven't, I don't have it in front of me, but like 13 days between starts, that's, that's a pretty long time, but based on the spacing of the schedule, there weren't a lot of windows to go the other direction. So well, I funny. also, that's kind of why when we spoke last week, I kind yeah. of thought that you probably would get one of these first two games just because it had been so long. Um, but just was such a long tonight. break for Hellebuck cuss. That's why they, they, they didn't want to go, uh, you know, basically that would have meant that Hellebuck started Tuesday against the Islanders and then Monday against the Bruins. So, uh, as much as you like to keep well, your back you up, back up in a against, rhythm against Ottawa, <laughs> you're like, ah, you know what? Maybe uh, the Bruins game was a good time to go in. It certainly wasn't on a Hellebuck's account that they didn't win that, win that game. Can one guy we have not talked about, but he did show up on that list of long streaks, yeah. is Rasmus Kapari. Um, you know, he excited a lot of people earlier on the season. You see that world-class speed. He can get in there, but he just it really hasn't clicked when it comes to any sort of offense. What do you make of his position within the Jets right now? with David Gustafson and Mark Scheifele potentially coming back soon. And, and the takeaways from the fact that Dominic Toninato is playing up above him in the lineup right now. Yeah, and I mean, the other the other night, Huss, in the, in the, during that penalty kill late in the third, Tony Nato's out there taking a penalty in the defense, or a face-off in the defensive zone during a penalty. So and we know how much Rick bonus values face-offs, and Tony Nato's now found himself on the third line, even though they gave Kapari a little bit of a pull in that situation as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it. I wouldn't say you should be nervous, but if you're Kapari, you'd certainly know you'd like to get something going offensively. Huss, it's wild. I thought Tuesday was the best game that he's played as a Jet by a landslide against the Islanders, and then he was pretty quiet on Saturday against the Senators and much the same on Monday against the Bruins. So uh, you need consistency. Again, we know he's just working his way back from injury, and they wish – the Jets wish they could have played, you know, three or four more games with the Moose. But at the same time, the way the roster is configured, if you're in the lineup, you got to produce or else they'll be looking at AJF or somebody else to, or like somebody like Gustafson to do the job for him. So again, I, I don't think that his, he's nearing the end of his rope by any stretch of the imagination, but there needs to be a, a progression or ascension in his play or he could find himself in the 13th forward spot, quite frankly. Well, the 13th forward spot, the reason why I sort of brought him up is that, you know, he's still a young player. He was oh, a yeah, they're not going to put him pick. on waivers, Huss. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see any scenario. I'm not saying you put him on waivers, but when we're talking about potential trades at the deadline, yeah. um, it, 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 like, is he a player that might be moved? And I guess the other question is, how much value do you think that he has, you know, considering... You know, the pedigree, I guess, that he comes with, but the fact that things just haven't really worked and never really did in L.A. either. I mean, I would say there would be other teams like the Jets who saw the potential in Rasmus Kapari that would be asking about him. Uh, but, it, you know, there's no way to put around it. He would be in the complimentary piece or, you know, augmenting a package kind of stage. He wouldn't be... Uh, it's hard to imagine a team saying, I'm not doing this deal for a rental without getting Kapari back. But, um, again, I don't think that the Jets are in any... 
they're they're not wouldn't be in any rush to move him. They're not ready to give up on him. Uh, it was recently that Rick Bonus, and I mean you've talked about it plenty on the show. Uh, Rick said they don't really know what they have yet, and and that's one hundred percent accurate. And Kapari has there's some you know tools that he has yet to unlock at this level uh, in terms of the offensive part of his game because he cre- there have been times where he's created plenty of chances, uh, but the finish hasn't been there. So uh, I, I still see a lot of potential in the player. Uh, I think he could be a very impactful fourth liner, but I think there's more upside. I think that uh, Kapari is a guy that you could see down the road potentially. You know, depending on what happens with uh, with Mason Appleton when his contract expires, like Kapari would be a guy that could potentially move into that third line uh, checking line plus role down the road, uh, depending on, like I said, if if Appleton uh, re ups or or whatever else. Are you so, surprised at all though that it, it, that it, it is Toninato in between Perfetti and Ayafalo, uh, just like as we're talking about this game tonight? Not really. I mean, I. I I, th- I like the fact that they were going to try Kapari in that role uh, when Lowry was up on the top line, but he just didn't get a whole lot accomplished. And uh, his faceoff numbers have been quite poor. And, you know, when you have Nemestikov already struggling in the circle a lot and Kapari not really winning any many draws, I, I just felt that Rick, Rick kind of has faith. Uh, like just Tony, let's just put it this way. Tony Nato has earned the trust of his coach in in critical situations, whether that's face-offs or you know killing penalties or defending a one-goal lead like he did on December 31st against Minnesota. And there have just been a few lapses on the defensive side in Kapari's game. Like, us, we can go back to game one of the season against Calgary. Everyone was ragging on Nate Schmidt for missing his guy, but Kapari didn't. He hit, he hit Lindholm, but he didn't seal him. And when his guy got in the inside and got to the net, he was the guy that got beat. And again, I'm not blaming him exclusively because there were a couple things that happened on the breakdown, but those are the kind of things Huss, that coaches remember in terms of trust, trustworthy situations and, and you know, the opposite when you haven't earned that trust yet. But I think Kapari still is a guy that's going to factor in uh, during the stretch run here. I think he'll benefit from getting away from the break, but coming back, I, when the, the game's getting faster in the second half, us, and it's getting to be a little bit more physical. So those are attributes that Kapari brings to the table. He's not going to be left in the dust because he's not—he's he's slow because he's not. He's a good skater. Um, as long as the you know we talk about the word processor of Cole Perfetti, as long as the hockey sense and hockey IQ and intelligence and all those things are keeping up with his feet, Rasmus Kapari can be a very effective player. Uh, but you know at the same time we also. You know, history has shown us that Rick Bonus flat out said to David Gustafson, "You need if you want to be on this team, you need to produce." So that was his message in the off season. Now, will Rick Bonus wait till the off season to deliver that message to Rasmus Kapari, or will he be you know demoted to the thirteenth forward position before that? That I don't know. But I think that if you're a Kapari, you've been in the re- you've been in the league long enough to know that if you're playing on the fourth line. And you have one assist. That's not a lot of production. And there are other guys knocking on the door, trying to leapfrog you on the depth chart. Having said all that, uh, you know he can't. He comes from a program where they've had a lot of playoffs. Uh, you know, not, I shouldn't say success, but a lot of playoff appeal in how they played against the Oilers in those uh, two first round matchups. And I think he knows to play how to play when the game is on the line. So that should serve him well during the stretch run. But he's going to have to play better and produce more if he wants to stay ahead of Gustafson and some of those other guys. Well, a big chance for him. I mean, uh, somebody like without yep. Shifley and Velarde in the lineup, I mean, uh, you know, one of those players that have been towards the bottom, if they can step up with a big performance tonight that go a long way to help your team this evening and probably help your spot <laughs> in Rick Bonus's lineup going forward. Ken, before we go, I have to ask you, we won't be talking to you on Friday, so I have to ask the obligatory weekly look ahead to the trade deadline convo. And, and hey, with you in Toronto today, you're talking with a lot of the other media members. Um, any new names that have popped up that might be of interest to the Winnipeg Jets and uh, maybe just the latest on your thoughts on what the Jets might be looking for and how aggressive they may be? Yeah, it's nothing really new, uh, you know, trying to sniff around with, you know, whether you see scouts or other media guys who could be available. It, nothing, no, no really new candidates emerging, quite frankly. Uh, and sorry, I think I've said that word five times this, uh, this episode, Huss. So we're going to, we're going to, I apologize in advance for that, but, uh, play the hits, yeah, Ken. yeah, play it, keep, keep them coming. Uh, Remo's going to have to get the drum set going in the backdrop for that one. Uh, Johnny Carson style, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that this is fairly, you know, I think what's become apparent during the stretch of games, you know, 
the Jets could use a little additional depth down the middle. And um, if if Gabriel Velarde is unable to, I would have liked to have seen Velarde at center at some point here, but obviously he's not available uh, due to injury. I pressed Rick as best I could. I thought that Velarde was moving very well on the ice uh, yesterday during the optional skate as compared to the morning skate the day before. Uh, but today he was held off the ice entirely. And when I asked Rick Bonus if there was a setback, he said, no, we just decided to keep him off the ice today. So uh, for a guy who's had injury concerns, I think it's smart to be cautious with Gabriel Velarde, but he's a guy the Jets have leaned on when he's been available. And and us, we t- I think we talked about this uh, after the game. Uh, Saturday's game against Ottawa was one of the first times in an awfully long time that Velarde wasn't driving play and has it wasn't as effective. So it makes sense that he was dealing with something uh, and some kind of lower body issue, but uh, without the ability to try uh, Velarde at center where you have a big bodied guy that maybe can be that second line guy and a, a complimentary piece to Mark Shifley without that being an option right now, you know, as, as well as Nemestikov has played. And I think he's played exceptionally well in terms of that role that he's been asked to do. I think if the Jets want to win 16 playoff games, Huss, and raise a trophy, I think they need to have uh, a little bit more of a, you know, if it's not a 1B scenario like they had when they had Dubois coming over the boards after Shifley, uh, it's got to be a clear-cut number two guy. And, and there will be times where that number two guy can move down in the lineup and Nemestikov can move up over four rounds. But I think right now the Jets would be looking, you know, to augment down the middle. And let, like, let's not kid ourselves. <laughs> Most of the trades that the Jets have made around deadline time have included a second line center. So it's natural for them to be looking for one. Um, so, and then too, the same thing we've been talking about on the back end for months. I mean, Nate Schmidt had done a very, very good job of solidifying his spot on the third pairing. I think that that third pairing had a couple of wobbly moments at times over the last little bit. I'm not saying that means the Jets have to go out and get a number six guy, but if if you want to win four rounds, and if Chris Tanev is available or someone like that, a bigger body guy with experience and everything else, I think it would you know it would behoove Kevin Chevel Day off to be involved in those phone calls, and I would be shocked if he wasn't involved in those phone calls. Yeah, so Tanev, Tanev, I mean, he'd be listen, perfect. We're talking I mean, about defense. I mean, to me, he's the perfect one, and same. I think it's a positive that he's got an expiring contract. Um, because the way the Jets are built right now, you're bringing Elias Salmonson, uh, yep. Billy Hanel is in the mix. I mean, you know, having a, a younger defenseman on an ELC that can play would be big for the team. One guy, Luke Gadsick mentioned this on the broadcast. You were obviously there, so you probably didn't hear it, but we kicked around the name Adam Henrique yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, fair. Adam Henrique, um, you know, listen, he's making, what, 5.8 this year, but it is an expiring contract. It'd have to be um, 50% retention for sure for Henrique to be an option. Is that that's just the way the numbers that the numbers would work even at the deadline? Well, they've had a boat of, I mean, they, we've been talking about the $5 million window listed on Cap Friendly and, and sites like that, but that I don't think includes Perfetti's performance bonus, which would be almost impossible for him not to hit the way that he's played this year. So I think you have to subtract. You're basically, to me, you have, I, I don't know what the prorated portion of that would be, yeah. but you're going to have to re- reduce that by. 850 essentially. So I think it's closer to four mil. So if you want to add a D man and a forward, even if you're only adding a, you know, league minimum or $1 million defenseman in order to get Henrique, to me, it has to be 50% retention. And as I would say this, I mean, I, I, I covered Adam Henrique at that 2010 Memorial cup in Brandon, when he was on that ridiculous Windsor Spitfires uh, juggernaut that also included Cam Fowler, Ryan Ellis, um, you know, and a couple of other Zach Cassian and a couple of other um, guys who went on to pretty healthy NHL careers. I, I think, and Henrik is a perfect example because you don't have to play him on the second line, but he can give you second line minutes. He's an exceptional skater. Uh, he can put up some offense, as we've seen. He can, I think, has killed penalties in the past. I think he's pretty good in the faceoff circle. And I would say that there'd be a lot of hunger for a guy like Henrik, who, as a guy on an expiring contract, would want to perform well on the big stage to earn his next deal. So well, I think sure. in a lot he, of ways I mean, he'd be perfect to us. I mean, he had that run with Jersey in his, oh, yeah. basically his first year to the cup final 24 games. Yep. He's played four playoff games since then in the right. decade. 
So um, I think you'd be a guy that would you would jump at the opportunity to get in with a team like this. Yeah, love the in, love in the bone, In Bones We Trust, this is what's beautiful about the chat. In Bones We Trust, second line center. How about Erickson Eck? Sign me up for that in Bones We well, Trust. Well, he's not going anywhere. Come yeah, on, people. Yeah, I was about to say. He's the number one center for Minnesota. A team and, that hasn't had hmm. one and, and would not be looking to move one. But sure, if you're looking for examples, perfect example, find the Joel, find the, who's the next Joel Erickson act? The guy that hasn't popped the way that he has from going from a third line center to a first line center. Um, okay. I, I said last one. This is the last one. <laughs> it's okay. And, and it can be very short if you want. Um, Rucker McGroarty, <laughs> chances that he signs at the end of the season and assuming the Jets are a playoff team, what would the chances that you would say, or what would have to happen for him to be in a lineup, not in a nothing game at the end of the year, but in a meaningful game, whether it be regular season or potentially playoffs? Well, so I should just say this. I mean, they're not, they're not the identical player, but I would say for Jets fans wondering about Rutger McGroarty, you should be watching Matthew Nyes closely tonight, Huss. If, if you're in that boat and you're wondering uh, what you might get, we're talking about a, a dominant NCAA forward in a power forwards body that can skate and produce an ample amount of offense. Uh, this is a guy who I saw two years ago at the University of Michigan, or sorry, Minnesota, playing at UND with Ben Myers as the center and Chaz Lucius as the right winger. And he went from playing in the national championship game to joining the Leafs on basically the taxi squad to jumping into the lineup and, you know, having an incredibly fun ride. And this year he's been up and down the lineup, but tonight he's going to play in a line with Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews. So I'm not saying that's Rutger McGroarty's path. I am saying that, yes, I, you know, I wouldn't want to use 100, but I'd say 90, 90 plus percent that Rutger signs his ELC at some point in May after the Wolverines have either won the Frozen Four or have been bounced out of the tournament. Uh, B, does he go directly to the Moose? Does he go directly to the taxi squad? That I'm not certain of. Uh, they could see an a ATO situation, I guess you could call it. Um, but I would think it'd be more similar to Andrew Kopp where he came out uh, after his year and then played that one game at the end of the year against the Flames. But in terms of where he slots in, will he be more than just a black ace player, Huss? That I don't know. But what I do know, his skill set will translate into playing well when the games get hard. But we should also always remember it's it's not the same way you can dominate competition at that level when you're just jumping in. But when you've been playing at a high level, it's easier for you to do to just kind of ride the wave. And that's what Matthew Nyes was talking to me about today. Uh, then you go home in the summer and you're like, holy smokes, I was part of a pretty cool two-month stretch there, even though for the Leafs it only ended up being a two-round uh, situation. But, sorry, long-winded way of saying that, Huss, I don't see uh, Rutger McGrady riding shotgun with Mark Shifley, but I could see him being in a scenario where, you know, if a player, offensive player got injured, maybe you could see Rutger jump into the lineup if an opportunity or a hole was created in that regard. He's also the kind of guy that, uh, I think he's mobile enough to play with Adam Lowry, but I haven't seen him play enough to know if you could just, I mean, I think it'd be more likely he'd be on a fourth line trying to generate. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I, I think it's more likely he might get some games at the Moose first, but it all depends on the circumstances and also has, depending on if they add at the deadline. But, I mean, I don't think, let's just put it this way. I don't think the Jets are counting on Rutger McGordy in the playoffs, but they cer not, certainly would not rule him out for contributing at some point. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time you saw a player with that no, sort of, of pedigree come in um, freshly after signing and all of a sudden be given the opportunity to make an impact somewhere in the lineup. And, you know, while we, we fret about, you know, how this group looks going forward, he is a guy that I think we should still have oh, in our yeah. minds. Oh, yeah, he's on the radar, yeah, for sure. Potentially being, uh, being a possibility. Kenny, great stuff as always. Uh, looking forward to a little K&R action tonight. And then, uh, and then back here. And then I guess you're on some travels. Are we going to be missing you on Saturday night? Is that uh... you will? That's confirmed. That is, uh, I will be on the show, but I will be on the show from uh, Playa del Carmen. So Mike McIntyre handling the uh, Saturday night gamer. So, but I'll be keeping a close eye on it as I will be keeping a close eye. How's the ticker after the uh, 
the wide right, the the Scott Norwood story uh, revisited well, here. Well, you know what? To be honest, I mean, uh, the the ticker was fine the second <laughs> that they took care of third down. Okay. Because fair. I fully assumed that he was going to make that, but I thought that it was more likely that Patrick Mahomes would use a minute 40 seconds in two timeouts to go down and get three points. Um, and you know, you're going to be down and play at Mexico. Say yeah. hi to the bills, say hi to the dolphins. <laughs> and uh, I'm hoping that if you're there for a week, maybe Lamar and the, uh, the Ravens will all pop by there. What do you think? Give it, give us a quick pick. Can the lions Oof. pull a shocking upset and get to the super bowl? And what do you think about the AFC championship game? Yeah, I mean the kind of the uh, question mark around Debo Samuel. I would say that has a, it would have a few people nervous for sure. Uh, I love the story for the Lions. I mean, um, hard not I, to cheer for that team. Amazing. And again, Huss, I watched the documentary on Barry Sanders, which was exceptional for the folks who haven't seen it yet. I mean, uh, if you're, you don't even have to be from Michigan to appreciate that story. Uh, do I think they're going to pull the massive upset? I. Again, I wouldn't I wouldn't throw down a whole lot on the cool bet lines there, Huss, let's say, but I would say it's not impossible. Um, uh, Jared Goff would have lots of motivation to play well in a game like that against a really good defense. Uh, in terms of the Chiefs, uh, again, I, w- I reluctantly picked them last week, and I don't mean reluctantly because I didn't believe in them. I just thought that it might be the Bills' Buffalo's year. It's a great team. Yeah, I mean, like then they've been in, like threatening enough that they had enough scar tissue kind of built up um, that it might might be kind of be time for them to bust through. But again, the Chiefs full marks. Um, Mahomes seems to be getting better and better. And, you know, Pacheco has been just an absolute force. And their defense, I think, is a hus. We always think about Kansas City as an offensive team. Their defense has really been spectacular. But now they have a different, I guess I shouldn't say it's a different kind of test because a similar. Oh, Rennie here, you know, pointing. He usually does that at the chat when he's not listening to you on the program <laughs> or something that he likes. But you're exactly right. Like the defense. Listen, they ran all over him for a good portion. They yep. stepped up at the end at Buff- that Baltimore running game. And and Lamar, Lamar is a phenom in, in, in his own right. Yep. But um, uh, what a matchup! I'm I'm feeling I am feeling confident right now. But uh, hey, Ravens are. Ravens Sorry, are I'm going to say Chiefs, right and I think it's Chiefs and Niners. I'm I'm going to go one upset. I guess it's not a big upset because of you know what happened. But I'm going to go Chiefs Niners Super Bowl. But I, I would love to see the Lions in it. Have a great trip, buddy, and enjoy the game tonight. We'll look forward to KNR afterwards. Thanks, as always. My pleasure, my man. Thanks for having me, and uh, have a great week ahead here. You got it. And, of course, Cheers. full reporting from Toronto in tomorrow's edition of the Winnipeg Free Press. All right, we're going to get Remo in here. Let's hear what Bones has to say. Uh, before we do that, a big thank you to Princess Auto for their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk, and a big congratulations to Princess Auto on the big announcement this week that the Bombers' home is now Princess Auto Stadium. Heard a funny, uh, well, it's not a funny, it's just a great story from, um, you know, somebody that had worked there before. And, and Princess has been a huge sponsor of the Bombers and all of our teams for a long time. But in a program where if you bought a season ticket, they would match and get the other one. And um, a great history of supporting the Winnipeg Football Club. And now it's been taken to another level. Amazing turnout at that press conference yesterday. And uh, listen, we're grateful for the support we get from Princess Auto, as I think all the sports teams are. And uh, here's to 10 great years and hopefully a few Grey Cup celebrations at Princess Auto Stadium. Looking forward to next year. Um, speaking of our local teams, gang, if uh, if you're going to that game on Saturday and you need to step up your game, making sure that the Jets are well represented when Leaf fans invade our building, uh, might I suggest a trip down to Royal Sports. All the jerseys personalized with your favorite player's name and number. Thousands of pieces of Winnipeg Jets merchandise, including many exclusives that you won't find anywhere else. So if you are a Jet fan and you are at that game, including our crew of WS tiers, make sure to come representing the home team because, uh, you know, the Leafs will. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Royal Sports 750 Pamela Highway. By the way, you know that they're hockey superstore as well in town. Snowboards, boots, bindings. If you're getting ready for a ski trip or snowboard trip and more. And all the cool stuff over on the King Skate Snow and Surf side. 750 Pamela Highway. Hit them up on Instagram as well. And follow up Royal Sports Pamela for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And a big thanks to our friends at Aikens Lake as well. They're getting ready for a huge summer coming up. The best fly-in fishing option in Manitoba. 
where you can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg. Find out more about booking and the Aikens experience now at AikensLake.com. All right, let's get Remo back in here. Remo, good stuff with Weaver. We had a lot of a lot of topics there. Yeah, the one thing that stood out to me when you had to ask him, uh, got to the end, when he said, okay, last one, keep it short, and he went for a super long time. No, it was him saying, what, 90% plus about Rutger McGrory signing with the Jets after the season, uh, signing his ELC, so we have to wait and see what happens there. He wanted to say 100, but just couch it and said, well, we'll make it 90% plus just to make sure. Yeah, you don't want to get uh, too far ahead of himself there, but... I mean, he's. I saw a thing uh, the other day on Twitter. I mean, he was what player of the weekend. Uh, he's having a great season. Came back from the injury. Um, you know, pretty awesome that he's. Yeah, sorry, he's Big Ten first star of the week. Uh, three goals, five assists, uh, in two games played. So we're keeping an eye here. The top prospect for the Jets, and we had him on the show uh, a couple weeks ago. He was great. So you know, that's certainly interesting development in terms of uh, the future of the club. Three goals, five assists in two games. Not yeah. bad. Not bad that's at good. all. And he, listen, and again, we don't say this about any prospects, about many prospects, but he does, and the reason why I brought it up, Reem, is that he does sort of fit the mold of a guy that would come in and just the incredible competitor that he is. Like, we see it all the time. Like, young players getting a shot in the playoffs and, really making their mark. Um, I, I, I would not rule it out. I guess we'll put that, we'll, we'll just we'll just say that. Don't rule out Rucker McGordy signing with the Jets, getting into some games, and who knows, maybe being a player come the Stanley Cup playoffs. That is a long ways off, and as Ken correctly mentioned, a big part of that will uh, be what happens in and around the NHL trade deadline. Um, let's hear what Bones had to say. Now, you were telling me this before, Kind of interesting audio today with uh, coming out of the Scotia Bank Center yeah, with Rick. <laughs> I don't know if they did it in a wind tunnel or what, or the Zamboni was going in the background, but I did my best with this one. Shout out to the Jets website for putting this all up. But we do have, I thought he spoke, there's always you know going to be a lot of microphones in your face in Toronto, but yeah, I spoke about bouncing back versus the Leafs, and we can get some feedback with the chat if they want to keep, keep going. I know Ken did mention you know, paraphrase a lot of his comments, but nice to hear it right from his mouth. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you, you, you keep the chat going, but in the meantime, let's hear what Rick Bonus had to say about uh, coming back and bouncing back tonight against the Toronto Maple Leafs. We want to play fast uh, against Boston. Uh, the first two periods we had, we just didn't break the puck open clean enough. It wasn't so much what Boston was doing as it was us fumbling the puck, you know, which allowed Boston to do what they, they were able to do. But for us, it's a big, thing, big part of our game is getting the puck out of our work. We're near the tops of the leagues and the breakouts, so we've got to get back on top of that. And we can get back on getting the puck out a lot quicker and uh, using our speed and getting a for that forward check. Then we're starting to play with the big jet on. What stands out about the Leafs? Pardon me? What stands out about the Leafs? Oh, they can score. You know, we have nothing but respect for all the high end talent they have over there. So we just have to be, uh, it's all about our nice awareness and about, again, playing it, play it defensively, playing out the puck the right way. You know, I, I had to laugh. It would kind of be funny if we had Nick or one of the Leaf people going on when you ask an opposing coach about the Leafs or oh, what stands out. Well, they can score. Uh, not a lot of uh, talk about what they do in their own end or their defense, and that's been a big, big part of their struggles to this point this year. But when you've got a guy going at the rate Matthews is, um, they're, he's dangerous every time he's on the ice. And, uh, you know, the Jets are going to need to continue to be that team that has been leading the team in goals against that they want to beat a team with the offensive firepower. Um, LB's in tonight. Hellebach presumably will start on Saturday. Um, no loss of confidence, though, in LB tonight who gets the start from Bones. Yeah, our team has been pretty, pretty structured all year. We've been up in the goalie zone. Uh, and you, you've, you've improved a lot of areas defensively. But certainly in the goal that we're getting from both of them, I'll be included, who will play tonight, uh, has been outstanding. It has been very consistent. Slow start, maybe, the first couple of weeks, but after that, the our goaltending has been very, very consistent, as has our team play, so it goes hand-in-hand. 
All right, a uh, little bit of praise for LB, but also with the team because it has been everyone pulling on the same rope with the uh, incredible numbers that Hellebuck and Brassois have put forth to this point this season after, as Bones mentioned, a uh, a slower start in the net, but also for the team overall through uh, October before everything just took off in the month of November. Um, one different the difference that we'll see is the return to a very familiar threesome. Adam Lowry back in between Nito Niederreiter and Mason Appleton. Appleton had a long goal-scoring drought broken these last couple games with uh, with two heading into Boston. <clears throat> Lowry, though, six games without, and Nito Niederreiter, 11 without. Here's what Bones was thinking in the reuniting Lowry, Apple, and Nino. Well, they were a dominant line for a long time, and the injuries kind of forced you to shuffling things around a little bit. When you don't see what you want to see, let's put them back together. Let uh, let us have one, you know, the dominant line like they were. Uh, we know exactly what we're going to get when they're on the ice, and uh, well, yeah, just hopefully they can get back on track. And um, now that they're back together and play like they were for a long time. How great the comfort with Mestikov, uh, and just wherever you put him, you know. Vlad, he's not Swiss Army. <laughs> Put him in. Guys like playing with Vladdy for two reasons. One is his, his hockey sense. He's got a great read of the game. He knows where he's supposed to be. But the other thing is when he gets the puck, he hangs on to it. He doesn't throw it away. And he usually makes the, the right, the, the high percentage play. So Vladdy's an easy guy to play with just because of those two things. And you know it's going to be there every night. So there's Bones on reuniting the Lowry line, as well as some praise for Nemetsnikov, who's going to be in between Connor and Ehlers. I mean, to me, Remus, when we look at this challenge of beating the Toronto Maple Leafs tonight, um, to me, the really the focus is on those two lines. I mean, if the third and fourth lines can just stay even when they're out there, and um, you know Lowry can do their job shutting down one of the top lines on the other side and get a couple from you know from either one of those two, two lines. I think the Jets give themselves a chance to win. And if you could get a win in matchups with the third or fourth line as they're put together, you'd be um, in very very good shape considering the loss of Shifley and Velarde. Yeah, the biggest thing for the Jets heading into tonight, us, is they don't have the pressure of the streak on their shoulders. I think they're going to be able to play loose and more free. You're not going to be cringing every time you give up a goal. Oh, no, the streak. And we raised the banner yesterday, 34 straight games <laughs> uh, The banner of uh, uh, three or less. But, yeah, it's going to be up to the top line to provide the offense tonight. That's Nemestikov with Connor and Ehlers. And I agree, those lines are going to have to play even hockey. And for the Leafs, I mean, they've got the two top lines that can score, but, I mean, their depth hasn't really been there for them and it's been Matthews carrying carrying the load and you know how many goals can we expect from Austin Matthews who's almost a, at a goal per game pace it's actually incredible you see a guy score 70 so I think well it couldn't be a spirited match tonight as it usually is with the Leafs and the Jets I don't know they only play like one twice a year but they seem I'm just thinking of uh what Spezza kneeing Neil Pionk in the head and all that starting. So, I want, you know, these back-to-back -back games, we had back-to-back -back with Minnesota earlier. and We remember what happened with those two games. And so <laughs> what's going to happen by the time we get to game two Saturday at Canada Life Center, we'll see. But for the Jets, or, yeah, they're going to have to try to stay, you know, stay even with and let the uh, top guys do the scoring. Um, uh, as we mentioned, no Shife, no Velarde tonight. Here's a, a quick update on the uh, injuries to the Jets from Bones. Rick, what's the latest with Gabriel Velarde? Uh, game day to day. Okay. Is there a study back at all? Or? Nope. Just kept him off the ice today. Okay. And then with Mark, would Saturday be an option or are you better off day, just waiting? Day to day. Okay. Would you first, would, <laughs> what would, would knowing that you know, there's a 10 day break coming yeah. after Saturday, will that factor into we'll, your decision? We'll always or? put his health first. He'll, he'll let us know what he's made. You know, credit to Weeb for knocking on the door. Bones. Looked in the window, kept it shut, and did not open it up with any more information. As I said, you know, Ken reported earlier in the week that he thought that it was unlikely that Shifley would pay before the play before the break. I hope that he was wrong. I don't think he is. Um, so uh, it's going to be a lot on the guys that are in the lineup tonight, um, depleted as they are without two of their top offensive players. And I, I mean, I guess we'll 
day to day for uh, Gabriel Velarde, whether that's day to day going through into February or he can be in the lineup. We'll find out more in the next couple of days. One more. And uh, you know, with all the, the national media around who many of our big fans of fans of Rick bonus through his five decades in the national hockey league. The fact that he's going to the all-star game for the first time was going to come up. Here's bones being asked about uh, the honor of being one of the all-star coaches, which will be in Toronto in a couple of weeks. Looking forward to it. Um, and it's a representative of the organization. Right? We've got great ownership in Winnipeg. Uh, Chipper and, and the ownership, they give us all the resources we need. They treat our players incredibly well. Chevy's done a great job with the roster and his, his management and the scouting staff. I've got a tremendous coaching staff here that make me look really good. Uh, they did a great job while I was away and they continue to do a great job every day. But certainly the players, they, our, our team game has been very consistent all year. There's been a few lulls, which is going to happen to every team. But for the most part, our players have worked hard every, every day, every, every game, and they've been a real pleasure to coach. So I'll be there and I'll represent all of the above. Is this the first for you? Thank you again. For an old man again. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, big smile on Bones. Looking forward to being part of the All-Star festivities coming up in Toronto. All right. Um, let's quickly get to the lines tonight uh, for the game. And, you know, when we were doing the lock shop, I believe when the game, when we first looked at it, the Jets were like plus 120. It was plus 125 during the lock shop. And I said to the guys, if you're thinking about betting Winnipeg tonight, I would suggest waiting because I have a feeling as more and more people realize the Jets are without Shifley, without Velarde, uh, that Hellebuck is not starting. You'll probably see more action on the Leafs, and that's exactly what's happening right now. The Jets are now plus 131 underdogs to win this game tonight, and the Leafs have gone to pl- uh, minus 154. Um, we'll get back to a couple goal scorers because I do want to touch on that. But other games tonight, the Panthers minus 247 against the Coyotes. Good one in Boston. We saw how good the Bruins are playing these days on Monday night. Bruins are hosting the Canes, Boston minus 140, Carolina plus 119. Uh, The Caps are a big minus 269 favorite over the struggling Capitals. The Kraken minus 294 favorites at home against the Blackhawks. The Blues playing back-to-back nights are in Vancouver to take on the first place Canucks. Canucks minus 239. And uh, the Sabres just lost to the Ducks. The Kings just lost to the Sharks. They're going head-to-head in L.A. Kings, minus 191 favorites in that one. As far as the Jets game goes, like we were kind of digging into these goal scorers a little earlier, Remus, and I'm kind of I'm feeling an Ehlers game tonight. Uh, I think Ehlers is going to get uh, plenty of opportunity, a ton of ice time. He'll be on that power play, plus 215. I know Kyle Connors plus 161, but I think that – the guy that I'm going to be putting a little sprinkle on is Nikolai Ehlers to score. Cole Perfetti's next at plus 345. I mean, tough to sort of get on Cole with, you know, playing with Tony Nato and Iafalo, um, just because the injuries are wreaking uh, havoc. Uh, but Nino's very due as well. Plus 355 on Niederreiter back with Adam Lowry might not be a bad bet. Yeah, you want guys who are going to get ice time, power play one, and, you know, sometimes you have to go with uh, their due theory. And Nino's a guy who's score. He's certainly getting an opportunity. Um, plus 355 for a guy like him, not bad. Maybe you do want to have better odds. And Nikolai Ehlers, again, top line with Kyle Connor, uh, power play minutes. They're going to lean on him to score goals. So and those guys are, are actually pretty decent odds, uh, Huss, like. Should Kyle Connor be that far ahead? I mean, Ehlers, he's plus 161, and Ehlers is 215. So, interesting they have all the, you know, all the Leafs guys ahead. I think the, Le- the Leafs are favored. You know, their team total is a bit higher. But sure, if you want to throw a little dart there, you know, I've been kind of, maybe not as much Adam Lowry now. I mean, he's plus 410, but if he was playing on the top line, silly. But yeah, sure, why, why not? But I think their role is going to be a bit different. Uh, today than it's been in the well, past. To be honest, to score, I actually yeah. think I like Lowry better in this situation mm-hmm. because I think he was just deferring a lot. I mean, just trying That's to fair. be defensive and get to those other guys where now back with Appleton and Nino, I think you might have a better chance of him shouting. I did say Niederreiter seems to score in bunches. Mm. Wouldn't it be nice to see Nino get a couple? Plus 26.50 for that one. Ehlers 12-1. to 1. For two tonight, so uh, you can check that out. 
thinking we might put together a little WST parley for the Jets to win an Ehlers goal. I guess they usually add a, a, an assist or a point for Josh Morrissey. Um, and Morrissey's got a little cold offensively as of late. He's minus 129 to get a point tonight. So keep your eye out on the exclusives. We did do separate exclusives tonight in the lock shop. I, I didn't really have any, like, like the lines were so big on some of the, the favorites. I ended up going with a puck line parlay. So I'm taking three teams that I think are, you know, big favorites to win, to win by two. We've got the Panthers over the Coyotes, minus one and a half. Florida got back on the win column in their last game after losing four in a row. I think Maurice keeps his team with the pedal down. The Kraken um, against the Blackhawks. Kraken minus one and a half at home. And the Canucks playing a Blues team that played last night. Minus one and a half. When we put that in, it was plus 736. Give a real nice boost to plus 825. And then Dusty's got a more, um, a more, well, shall we say conservative parlay. Panthers to beat the Coyotes in regulation. Bruins to beat the Carolina Hurricanes. And the Canucks to win in regulation is plus 450. Um, so both of those are up in the lock shop section right now mm. at Cool Bet. And if you haven't played there before, use the promo code WST for a 100% bonus up to 200 bucks on your first deposit. I know there's lots of games tonight, but we're all just locked in on the big one tonight between the Jets and the Leafs. Lots of games tonight. I do like your parlay. Vancouver, you know, they played uh, a bit of a nice stretcher. They played Chicago the other day, and I think they got out early to a lead and just slept walked through that one. It's funny. Edmonton continued their winning streak last night against Columbus. I think they took the first two periods off and then turned it up in the third. It's been interesting watching some of these top teams when they get matched up against uh, lower teams. But yeah, a lot of games, a lot of games tonight. But yes, the big focus is on the national game, Winnipeg and Toronto. And it is, what, a six o'clock start? It's early, you know, in Toronto. So I'm pumped. I'm excited for this. I'm ready for all the tweets from all the Toronto media about I don't know, the Jets and how much, how good they are or how they're getting embarrassed. I don't know how it's going to go tonight. Uh, well, we will see, but um, it's going to be fun. I, I was I was kind of in a very pessimistic mood when I heard the news that Shifley and Velarde weren't going to play. But as we've gone through this program, knowing what we know about the Winnipeg Jets, the way they played this year, the way guys have stepped up at different times, I'm actually now feeling positive about this one tonight and uh, would love to see them get the first of two, stop any losing streak and get some positive momentum going into what will be a big game. Although I guess if they were going to win one of the two, I'll, I'd much rather have the home win because we're of course going to be there. By the way, just I wanted to give a quick shout out to everyone that jumped on the WST parlay ream because you know, our packages I mean the, the, the ticket pack. Yeah, yeah, sorry, the ticket pack. The ticket parlay, if you will. <laughs> um, our four-game package that so many of you jumped on at the start of the year, which had the Kings game at the beginning of the season, the Oiler game in November, this game against the Leafs, and Calgary at the beginning of April. I believe the total was 375 all in. Upper bowl seats for this game on Saturday night. Basically, anywhere in the upper bowl, are going for 200 bucks. So uh, there you can see the remaining resale tickets that are available. It does look like they've got a few available in uh, in 316. If, uh, is that is what the, section you're in? Is this someone from our ticket pack reselling their ticket us, trying to make some money? <laughs> I couldn't be. That could not be. I don't know. I have no idea. If they're no Leaf idea. fans, if they're Leaf fans, we're going to do a full investigation. It's Oh Find man! Out who it was and someone's in a the, row. Yeah, put them on the list. <clears throat> yeah, imagine if someone's in a row in a Leaf jersey who bought they the WSTP. They will WST not be welcomed. Pick. They will not be welcomed with the same sort of hospitality we normally do. Um, but anyways, tickets are crazy for that game. Oh, I'm losing my voice today. Tickets are crazy for that game today, or game on Saturday. Uh, but another great reason to uh, thank all of you for jumping on that and making that package such a uh, such a success. Uh, I am. Uh, I, yeah. I cannot wait for this one on uh, on Sunday. But uh, 
It is. It's an A game. There's only a few of them all season long. Saturday night. We know there's lots of Leaf fans that are invading. And I will say this. If there was one game that was going to be really expensive all year, uh, that we got at a great price with our season tickets or ticket packs, make it the Leaf game. And, uh, you know, stick it to those fans if they're uh, just deciding to come in for one game and cheer against the home team. So, uh, anyways, Saturday is going to be awesome. Focus in on tonight first. Um, hey, Reem, before we go, and I know we do need to get this up because it's a game day, but uh, well, I-, I meant to ask you about your thoughts about the WWE signing a massive, I think it was a $5 billion deal with Netflix and uh, your favorite weekly wrestling show is now going to uh, Netflix. Yeah, $5 billion deal, 10 years to have uh, WWE Raw uh, as the ex- or on Netflix and it'll be the exclusive home of WWE content outside the US. So all the stuff that used to be on Sportsnet, Premium Plus, uh, no longer there, it's, you know, going to be moving to Netflix eventually. I find that interesting. The first, what, live sports thing uh, on Netflix. I just wonder what it means for, you know, future sports rights. Um, Are we going to see more on Netflix? How is this going to go? Are people going to be subscribing to Netflix to get raw? And I think we're just seeing a lot of fragmentation of sports if you want to watch all of them. I mean, what, so they have Raw and SmackDowns on a different network. Um, for NFL, what, you have to get Prime for the Thursday night games. MLB, I think, is a total mess. Where you have the Apple game and where there's like a Peacock national game, ESPN. So I don't know if it's the best uh, for the consumer in the long run, but certainly great for the, for the leagues and uh, $5 billion. I mean, how do you say no to that? And... I so did see some numbers that when Netflix had similar subscriber base to USA, which were they were on before. So a bit of a rejigging here going on as we move forward. And again, this NHL national leads me to the NHL national rights because this WWE is for outside of US. And what is it going to be? You know, we're kind of been lucky here um, that we haven't had to, you know, go with the streaming game. We didn't have the streaming playoff game on Peacock that so many in the U.S. were up in arms about, but I imagine that's going to be coming soon. And But how are these companies like Bell and Rogers going to compete with Amazon and Netflix if they're just giving out all this cash? Fascinating. And how it's going to work. Will they be able to deliver the content? And there was what one of the executives was on, Pat McAfee, said, we might not even do Monday Night Raw on Monday anymore because they're concerned about competition with Monday Night Football, but I mean, you've been going up against them for, for 30 years here, so I don't know why now all of a sudden you'd be concerned. Well, it, it, you know what I mean? I guess they're just looking to get more eyeballs on it, um, but there, there's there's a lot more to this. I My buddy Gabe Morenci is saying that this is something the CFL should be looking into. Um, and can you imagine you know, having CFL games available via a service like Netflix, which included some sort of like a behind-the-scenes show yeah. that followed the players. I mean, there's so many great characters and individuals in the Canadian Football League. I think there's a lot of potential for this, but it's not just going to be the two bidders before. I Hopefully that'll be good for the consumer. I guess we'll see. Um, Spency, will they release the whole season of WWE all in one night? No, no. It's live programming, Spency. It is live programming. Um, I see waiters wanting my thoughts on the new heights. I've actually just sent Remo over a clip. Maybe we'll finish off the show with that because it really, really is hilarious. Um, But Joel Kevinson said, WWE Network, I can now take off my package. Joel, okay, I'll I'll put this to you and any other wrestling fans that have the the, the night. So the Royal Rumble, which is probably the second most fun night for wrestling fans a year, right up there with WrestleMania, is on Saturday night. Usually it's on Sunday. It's not on. They don't want to compete with the NFL. Who does? It's on Saturday night. Obviously, we're going to be at the Jet game, and I'll be locked in on that. So I went to WWE Network to PVR, and I was looking on Saturday night, and I'm like, well, where the hell is it? And I guess it's now, the like, that WrestleMania is now, like, a Sportsnet Plus premium thing. So I, too, like you, I'm going to cancel my WWE Network. I certainly don't need it if things like the Royal Rumble aren't on it. 
And I guess I might have to suck it up, but I don't even know. Can I like do I get Sportsnet Plus on my TV? Can I PVR it so I can watch it later when I'm not there? I have many questions, but just as a uh, PSA from yours truly, if you were wanting to watch the Royal Rumble fan and you thought you were getting it on WWE Network, I don't think we're getting it here in Canada on the WWE Network anymore. So, um, anyways, there's our there's our little bit. Oh, all oh yes, yeah, so the premium live events on Saturdays now. Yeah, I think it works better. It makes more sense, and uh, you can work at it later. All right, listen. Before we go, we know Jason Kelsey stole the show in Buffalo, jumping out of the suite, chugging beers shirtless. Taylor Swift got her opportunity to meet Zach Caleros. Um, uh, Reen, did you get this clip? Yeah, I have the clip. You want me to play this Jason Kelsey clip here? Yeah, yeah, if you can. This is a fun way to end the program. You can check the entire podcast out, The New Heights. But talking about the weekend, obviously, Travis's big game for the Chiefs. Uh, but whatever we wanted to talk about, what was happening in the suite and the Jason Kelsey show that was put on in Buffalo. Here's a clip. You celebrated my touchdown by taking off your shirt, screaming, jumping out of the suite, chugging a beer with the fans, then jumping back into the suite. I watched this and it was pure pandemonium. Just pandemonium. Tell you what, man, if you don't run for president, this is all is just going to go to waste. <laughs> this is all just, a, it looks like a political campaign. Stop. Stop. There's nothing political about this. This is just a man in his elements with his Bill's Mafia compadres <laughs> enjoying the dead of winter. That's what this is. <laughs> I wish I would have stayed out there longer to actually get my nipples hard enough. Your thermostats couldn't gauge how cold it was yet? My thermostats didn't regulate to the temperature. <laughs> there was not enough cameras on the suite where you could see Kylie, though. I wanted to see her reaction to all of this so bad. I'm not gonna lie. I gave Kylie a heads up. The moment we got into the suite, I said, I'm taking my shirt off and I'm jumping out of that suite. And she said, Jason, right. don't you dare. I was like, hey, I'm just letting you know what's happening. I'm not asking for permission. I'm doing once a Kelsey man's determined, there's no f stopping him. And she was already telling me to be on my best behavior because we were meeting Taylor. This is hilarious. I was like, Kylie, when I met you, the first day I met you, I was blacked out drunk and fell asleep <laughs> at the bar. This is part of the charm. This is part of the Jason Kelsey charm. I want to make my best first impression. This is my best chance. My best first impression is the worst impression ever. So I, I, I could just build <laughs> from that, that point. Nice oh, yeah, level. exactly. <laughs> Kelsey brothers, I, I do honestly think that if you had, and we talked about this on Monday after the game, like just general popularity rankings, Jason Kelsey is that dude. And uh, if he ran for president or something like that, he probably would win. Uh, anyways, that's out right now. Travis has got to worry about a big football game on the weekend. And uh, who knows, maybe Jason Kelsey will be doing, uh, having some more fun in Baltimore um, I'm more concerned about the Chiefs having fun in Baltimore, but that is going to be a tough game. We'll be all over that in the next couple of days. Hacksaw will set it up with us on Friday. Um, gang, that is going to do with us. Hey, one more why not question of the day for not all corporate Waverly and McGillery before we go. Who you got tonight? Jets going to win? Hit us up in chat. Hit us up in chat. I would love to know the confidence levels of Winnipeg Jets fans. Bit of a depleted lineup. LB in. Uh, but as they say, my confidence level has been raising as we've talked about this game over the last couple days. We'll see whether that was foolish or not when they drop the puck at 6 p.m. tonight. Big thanks to Ken as well. Schickster's with us. Jets 3-2. I like it. Um, waiters. <laughs> Come on, waiters. Uh, man, a great show, guys. Go, Jets. Go. Oh, B.A. Smith. Well, B.A.'s had a lot of bad takes before. Not all of them. He's saying 3-1 Leafs. Fade BA and a lot of other uh, <laughs> Reggie Dunlop, seven, five jets. Wow. Can you get seven goals from this lineup tonight? I mean, there will be, uh, they might have a day of mourning um, for Ilya Samsonov in uh, Toronto tomorrow. Uh, anyways, uh, big thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Uh, and of course, Ken Weeb, who joined us, check out KNR after the game tonight, right after legal curve, shout out to the IC guys, Ezzy, a lot of run today on his big tweet, uh, tweet about the streaks. And of course the golden muzzy Nick Alberga. And of course, Michael Remus for making it all happen. Gang, we'll uh, get after it tomorrow. Uh, Bill will pop by. I think we're wiki. Talk a little football and uh, hoping to have a couple more guests from Toronto about this home and home series. 
We're working on that. So make sure you don't miss it. Join us live 1 p.m. on YouTube. And uh, as soon as that podcast drops for your drive home, wherever you get your favorite podcast, search Winnipeg Sports Talk. Have a good one tonight. Go Jets go. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.